Good morning, we are live from Council Chambers. Before we begin, I will go over the emergency response plan for this room. In an emergency, everyone must evacuate through the nearest safe exit. Those seated in the gallery take direction from security to evacuate. Council takes direction from the meeting clerk. After evacuating the room, please proceed to a stairwell. Take the stairs to ground level and evacuate the building through the doors marked emergency exit and go to a muster point. Do not take an elevator or walk through the city room. Anyone with limited mobility should identify themselves to security or the meeting clerk during an evacuation. Finally, please speak with security or the meeting clerk if you require first aid. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order. And at this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and Métis homelands and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nikorasu, as well as Métis and Inuit, now settlers from around the world. Uh, roll call of council colleague, committee colleagues, Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Jans. Good morning. And Councillor Wright. Good morning. And I will see if other colleagues are joining us as well. Councillor Rice. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. All right. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Councillor Hamilton, adoption of the agenda, please. Yes, I will move adoption of the April 10th. A 2024 executive committee meeting uh, with the following changes the addition of item 7.6 single source uh, request Canadian Red Cross for emergency response services and the deletion of item 7.4 ride transit program funding update okay uh, please vote We're just waiting for one vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, approval of the minutes. Councillor Salvador, you want to do that? Yep. Uh, I'll move approval of the, of the minutes from the March 20th, 2024 Executive Committee meeting. Okay. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Any protocol items? I see none. Uh, select items for debate. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. We have speakers on items 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3. So I'll select yep. those. And uh, uh, we also have a request to speak on item 7.5. So I will yep. select that as well. Okay. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you. Um, can I select 7.6, please? Yes, you can. Okay, so it's seven one, seven two, seven three, seven four has been already deleted from the agenda. Seven five and seven six are also selected. Uh, There's nothing to vote on, right? Okay. Uh, request to speak. Councillor Hamilton, you have the list? I okay. do. Yep. Um, I will move that executive committee hear from the following speakers in panels when appropriate. Um, on items 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3, Panina McBrien from the Edmonton Downtown Business Association, Cherie Clausen from the Old Strathcona Business Association, Lauren Farnell in person, Dan Mason, remote, Lindsay Harrison of Due North Events, uh, Nolan Thiessen, Explorer Edmonton, Todd Jaynes, Edmonton's BIA Council, 
Brent Oliver in person, uh, uh, David Plamondon, and Marie Petrov of Francis Winspear Center for Music, uh, Hannah Choi, Francis Winspear Center for Music, uh, Brian Christensen, and Ryan Bird, and that is time specific at 1.30. Um, and on item 7.5, uh, affordable housing site, lands or sale of land below market value and grant funding, Kenora and Garneau, Brian Peel in person, Stefan Fechner in person, and Mark Poch Pochman, my apologies, Mr. Um, Mr. Pochman, uh, if, if I mispronounce your name, also in person, uh, as well as Susan McGee, Homeward Trust Edmonton, Scott Gallant, Edmont uh, Homeward Trust Edmonton, and Glenn McGrath of Homeward Trust Edmonton. Thank you. So please vote to uh, hear from those speakers. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Requests on specific time on the agenda, none other than what to be improved. Uh, any counselor inquiries? <coughs> Seeing none, the report to be dealt with at a different meeting, none. Request to reschedule, none. Unfinished business, none. Public reports, okay, 7.1 will be one third at one thirty. So we go to, uh, oh, this. So 7.1, are cross-referenced. Uh, so we go to our first item on the agenda is affordable housing site sale of land below market value and grant funding Kenora and Garno. And we'll go to administration for a presentation. Now we'll go to our speakers. Just in case I don't, I, I may, speakers might be expecting this item to be later on the agenda. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll go through the list and if, see if they're all here or not. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Flamman. I'm the Deputy City Manager for Community Services. I'm here with members from our Housing and Homeless and Real Estate team seeking Council's approval of the required budget adjustments, land sales at below market value, and affordable housing agreements required to proceed with the construction of two city-led permanent supportive housing projects. With that, I'll pass it over to Stacey Galatly, Branch Manager for Social Development. Thank you. Slide two, please. In 2008, Edmonton adopted its first four-year affordable housing investment plan, which positioned the city using its own pre-approved envelope of funding as an early investor in affordable housing projects. Since 2019, every dollar that the city has invested in affordable housing has attracted another $4 in investment from other orders of government and affordable housing partners. The updated affordable housing investment strategy targets the construction of 1,400 to 1,700 units of supportive housing for people experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness by 2027. In pursuit of that target, in 2023, the City applied to the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, the CMHC, and the Alberta Social Housing Corporation, the ASHC, for financial support in relation to three City-led permanent supportive housing projects. The proposed projects are Hollywood, Kenora, and Garneau neighborhoods. The Hollywood P, uh, permanent, sorry, the Hollywood PSH, which is permanent supportive housing, uh, received both CMHC funding for 12 million and ASHC funding for 4 million and is currently under construction. The remaining two projects were supported by the ASHC through funding of 4.25 million to Kenora and 2.4 million to Garneau. But to date, the city has been unable to be successful in securing CMHC funding for these projects. Next slide, please. There is a risk that if we do not move forward with the two unfunded projects in a timely manner, the provincial funding commitments from the ASHC fund for the projects is at risk as the funding program is oversubscribed. And if we do not secure funding soon, they will seek to retract and recollect the funding to best meet immediate needs. Administration recommends using previously approved city funding to close the 33.4 million funding gap required to advance these PSH projects while continuing to seek additional funding from, for the projects from other orders of government. 
The approved funding we're recommending to access is the $11.9 million held in abeyance as well as $21.5 million from the capital profile of affordable housing, land acquisition and site development. Next slide, please. So I'd like to share some site-specific information. The Kenora PSH is proposed to be located at 10111 154th Street Northwest on a site that was purchased by the city in 2021 for the purpose of supportive housing. The preliminary design of the project was advanced in anticipation of CMHC funding and is substantially complete. The intention is to construct one residential apartment building of up to four stories on the site, which would include 63 studio units, nine of which are designed to be barrier free, plus associated support, amenity and ceremonial space. Next slide, please. The Garneau PSH is proposed to be located at 11049 83rd Avenue Northwest in the community of Garneau. The site was purchased by the city in 2020 and rezoned in 2021 to prepare it for the purpose of supportive housing. The preliminary design of the project was also advanced in anticipation of CMHC funding and is also substantially complete. The intention is to construct one residential building of up to six stories on the site. That would include 34 studio units, five of which are designed to be barrier free, plus associated supports and amenity space. Next slide, please. In consideration of previous city contributions to prepare the site and advance the design and funding commitments from ASHC, the funding gaps are as follows. For the Kenora PSH project, there is a funding gap of 21.4 million, and for the Garneau PSH project, there is a funding gap of 12 million. Therefore, the total funding gap for both projects is 33.4 million. To close the gap, administration recommends using 11.9 million held in abeyance for the purpose of leveraging funding from other orders of government for supportive housing and 21.5 million from the previously approved ha affordable housing land acquisition and site developed capital profile. Administration will continue to seek funding opportunities from other orders of government to offset these costs, including the potential of an RHI 4, which we may learn about in the upcoming federal budget announcement on April 16th. Next slide, please. Assuming that the funding is approved, the city's IAS department will lead the design and construction of the Kenora and Garneau PSH projects. When complete, the projects will be transferred to Homeward Trust, who would be responsible for ongoing management and contracting and contracting third party operators for the projects. Prior to the transfer, the city will enter into affordable housing agreements with Homer Trust in relation to each project to ensure that they continue to serve as supportive housing for 40 years or more. Next slide, please. In order to move forward with the project, we do require Council's approval in relation to four key decision points. First, budget adjustments to accept the funding committed by ASHC to the projects. Secondly, land sales below market value to Homer Trust to allow for the transfer of projects. Third, affordable housing agreements between the City and Homer Trust to ensure that the projects continue to provide supportive housing in the long term. And finally, approval to use the $11.9 million held in abeyance and $21.5 million from the Affordable Housing Land Acquisition and Site Development Capital Profile to close the funding gaps for the projects. Next slide, please. Uh, we would now be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. And uh, uh, we will go to our speakers now. And I will check if... Uh, Everyone is here. Brian Peel in person. Brian, please uh, uh, come down here and uh, grab one of the chairs. You'll be first speaker. Uh, Stefan Fechner in person. I know, yeah. Okay, no worries. So grab one of the chairs, please. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, if you want to sit down, because there are other speakers as well, right? So we'll put you in a panel, right? So, and if you want to check with uh, with Stefan, he can also call in. If They can also call in. Is Stefan, if he wants to call in. Okay, so they can, maybe, maybe I'll do my five-minute presentation. Yeah. And then Stefan and Mark Peckman are available for questions. 
Okay, no worries. So if, if they wish to do so, they can join us virtually. If you want to let them know, okay? And clerk will let them know as well, right? If they, we have their contact. So, so Stefan, Fackner, and Mark, uh, 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 Pacman? Pacman uh, are to answer questions only. Uh, and Susan McGee, Home Art Trust. Susan, are you there? Uh, I am. Okay. Uh, Scott Gallant, Home Art Trust. I am here. Okay, and uh, Glenn McGrath, Home Art Trust. And I'm also here. Great. Okay, so each of you will have five minutes to make your presentations. Then after that, uh, uh, committee members and council members may have questions to you, so please uh, remain in the panel. Uh, but before we begin our discussion, I want to share uh, my expectations or our collective expectations for the conduct of everyone participating to ensure a safe and inclusive environment and workplace. These expect expectations apply equally to both in-person and virtually virtual attendees. Hearing from the public is an important part of council's process to ensure we hear the full diversity of opinions that exists in our community. As meeting chair, I have a responsibility to ensure the safety of all participants in today's meeting. As part of that responsibility, inappropriate comments or gestures will not be tolerated. If they occur, I will direct the, uh, I will direct the clerk to immediately remove anyone engaging in such behavior. The type of behavior that will result in the removal from the meeting includes making disrespectful comments directly at individual staff members or other public speakers or using profane, pro, profane language. Uh, responsive behaviors to show support or dissent, such as shouting, cheering, clapping, or using the chat or emotion response features in the Google Meet are also not permitted. I will not provide any additional warnings or once removal, the person will not be permitted to rejoin the meeting. This meeting is being live streamed and everyone is welcome to view the live stream online. Again, my role as chair is not to moderate the nature of the content being discussed, but to ensure chamber behaviors are maintained to support a safe, respectful and neutral space for my colleagues city employees, and the public. I thank everyone in advance for your respectful participation in today's discussion. With that, we'll go to uh, our pub pub first speaker, Brian Peel. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, councillors. Um, I'm addressing the issue of the uh, development, affordable housing or supportive housing development on, in Garno. And uh, I want to say off the, uh, right at the start that we are, I am not opposing supportive housing at all. This is not why I'm speaking today. I'm speaking because I'm personally involved in this particular development. I live on the site. That is a site that is comprised of three separate lots. I, uh, do you have the, uh, the two pages that were distributed? Good. That's my house. Uh, I've lived in that house for many years. It's, uh, our family owns, has owned it for 70 years. My dad used to work at the university. And it's just uh, has ended up being an artifact on the block. It's literally the only house on the block. So um, what happened was, in, as um, the, uh, the lady spoke a, a while ago, mentioned that the, that the three properties uh, were purchased in 2020 by the city of Edmonton for the development of, at that time, it was expressed as affordable housing. That was a bit of a, a concern to me because uh, they bought the two lots next to my property. What the city didn't know, and, and this is an important point, the lots were advertised for sale as an RA9 development opportunity. All three lots were zoned RA9, including my lot. And that was actually not true. That was a misrepresentation of the lots. They were not an RA9 development opportunity. They were only a potential RA9 opportunity because they had an isolation clause attached to them. 
and CBRE, the broker, apparently didn't do their due diligence and didn't know that there was an isolation clause, nor did the city. And so once the city purchased the lots, I guess their intention was to build on the two lots and isolate my property, which is completely inappropriate from a development standpoint. You don't develop on two lots when you can develop, develop on three. Then they found to their surprise that there was an isolation clause. It was probably the only RA9 site in Edmonton that had the clause. It was put back in by a retired city planner named Brian Kropp, who lives in Garno. And he realized what would happen if there, if, if on this site, because of some of the political history around in Garno on that site. Uh, apparently, I didn't know this, but he fought tooth and nail to get the isolation clause put back in, and it was approved by the city and put back in. An isolation clause does not preclude development, but it makes it difficult. And it requires the person to buying the two lots in this case, it requires that, that uh, person or group to enter into negotiations with the isolated property. And, uh, and it's, uh, so the, the, point, the purpose of an isolation clause is twofold. One, to protect uh, the person that's potentially going to be isolated, i.e. myself, from being isolated. And the second purpose is to foster consolidation of lots. That was kind of the main driving force behind the isolation clause. But uh, it wasn't working out very well, so the city removed the isolation clause from all the RA9 properties. So the city found out that it did, had bought properties that had an isolation clause and discovered that it was not going to be an easy process to build. And just one more point about that. When you have, when you bought, when they advertise the properties as an RA9 development opportunity, the expectation was that the city would be able to come in and, and just, you know, really proceed with development without much fuss. Uh, there would be an application for a development permit, but there would be no, no restrictions really stopping the city from developing. But the isolation clause changed that completely. So the city then approached me to see if they wanted to buy my property, or if I would be, excuse me, if I would be willing to sell my property. And I didn't say no, we just began a, a discussion. It was Alistair Hodgson from the real estate department. So we went back and forth. What they didn't know that is I have, a, I have training in architecture and I had been uh, thinking about uh, the potential of developing on this site f since the year 2000. And I had done an initial uh, design for a 20-story condominium tower um, back in the year 2000, more as an intellectual exercise. But then in 2000, the year 2019, I began to get serious about the idea of developing on the site. And I developed a full-blown proposal for a 37-story, super narrow condominium tower with only about a, 100 to 140 units in it, a, a real cutting-edge um, uh, design. And uh, it was a 25-page proposal. I was going to give you a copy, but I decided it would, that would just be a little much for this morning. The city didn't know this, so I mentioned this to the city. And I told the city that I thought my property, and all three properties were worth about a million dollars apiece, based on what I would build on the, on the property at that time. I, so the, uh, the price of a property is related to what's going to be built on it. Yeah. So, so we Brian, went back and... I so, am so sorry, five minutes are up. Oh dear. Maybe we'll ask questions on, then you can probably make the remaining points that I, we have. I apologize, no, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, I no. can be a bit talkative, but I... Yeah. Uh, we'll come ask back. ask a question? Yeah, we, will, we will. There might be questions from uh, uh, committee members to you, then you can elaborate on the remaining of your Th presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, good. Okay. Yes, sir. And I'll check if uh, Stefan Fackner is joining us. Stefan is uh, not here in okay, person. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and Mark uh, neither, uh, neither is not Mark here. Okay, no. got it. Yeah. Okay. And next we'll go to Susan McGee. Hi, Mayor um, and uh, members of the Executive Committee. We are here to answer any, any questions. I know that there's uh, much work to be done uh, going forward, depending on today's decision, but we're here as the, uh, the partner in providing the supports on site. Good. So I send then all three of you, you, Scott, and yeah. Glenn are here to answer questions only then. If they're... Yes, that's oh, correct. Got it. Okay. All right. With that, I'll go to council members uh, for, uh, for questions, uh, committee members and council members for questions to uh, members of the public and, uh, and delegation from Homeward Trust. Uh, go ahead, Councilor Jans. Thank you. If I can ask Mr. Peel. So essentially there's, uh, it, 
before us, we have a recommendation to to proceed with with um, um, development and and process here. And am I to understand what what is your preferred outcome here? Well, my I want to see the city build supportive housing. So this is not about preventing the city yeah, from building. I want clearly. to make that very very clear. Um, I'm caught in the middle here, so I'm I'm wedged in. The current situation is this: the city has tried to. The city has not negotiated with me. I'm going to give you what they did is they they never made an offer in 2021. Instead of making an offer to me, they rezoned their properties and downzoned. In so doing, they removed the isolation clause, and then in removing the isolation clause, they isolated my property and devalued my property. And then they offered me an offer I couldn't refuse, basically. They said, here's our offer. But they did ask me to supply an appraisal, which I did. I paid, that was Mark Peckman, the appraiser. I paid him and he did an appraisal and uh, I submitted it to the city. They sat on it for two and a half months and they got back to me and said, nope, we don't agree with your appraisal at all. Uh, we're prepared to offer you this number and it was $180,000 less than Mark Mark's appraisal value. It was completely unacceptable. It was less than I'd been offered for the city back in 2000, and, uh, sorry, less than I'd been offered for the properties by a developer back in 2008. So I declined their offer. They said, fine, we're no longer interested in developing your, uh, buying your property. We're gonna go ahead and develop. They put up a sign that said, uh, for sale for affordable housing. Uh, it was up, the sign was up for about a year. It blew down in a windstorm. Uh, nobody bought the properties, so uh, they approached me again this fall and said, uh, uh, you know, uh, good news, we're still interested in buying your property and we can offer you $11,000 more. Um, so I didn't say no, but I didn't say yes, so we began to uh, interact again. At that time, uh, I um, asked for a meeting with, uh, in person with real estate, affordable housing, and the appraisal department. And Stefan Fechner, who's a retired city planner, about 35 years experience, and I went to that meeting. One thing I should tell you, so. Sorry, this Mr. Peel, I have, like, I have only five minutes to ask questions, and I, I need to yeah. kind of, with respect. Please, I, I apologize. Kind of cut to the chase here. It, are you asking us to halt this item today or not? Are you asking us to purchase your property or not? Are you asking to do, us to do something entirely yeah. different? I'm willing to sell my property to the city for the full appraised value. I had a new appraisal done and, and they wouldn't consider it. And so what I'd like the, the council to do today is I think you should vote to approve uh, according to the, the item there, you're, you're being asked to approve uh, the uh, city selling uh, their properties to Homer Trust, I believe, for a reduced amount and that requires council approval. I think you should do that, but I think you should put in a caveat. And the caveat is that no development should occur on the Garno site until this issue with me is resolved. Because what they're threatening to do right now, and this is literally a threat, they're threatening to, to they won't consider my appraised amount, which is a fair market value. And it, they won't even talk about it. And so they're saying, no, we're not, we're not gonna talk about your appraised amount. We're just gonna go ahead and build. That will isolate my property, destroy the value in it completely and ruin it's unthinkable, actually, what they're, yeah. what they're trying to do. So what, what, what I recommend, Councillor Jansen, Councillors, and Mr. Mayor, is I would ask you to uh, put an amendment to the, uh, the report that, uh, that, that you would give to the full council recommending that the city um, purchase my property or enter into, purchase my property for the appraised amount. It's a fair amount. Okay. I'm not asking for the moon, sure. it's the current market value. May I say just one quick thing? So that's what I'm recommending, is that you, you go ahead and approve, recommend that the, uh, this has got to, this has got to uh, proceed. That's one option. The other option is that the city can move the supportive, the supportive housing project in Garno to an alternate site, because at the meeting I had in person, the representative from affordable housing, Jeff Koo, told me they have two shovel, shovel ready sites available right now where they can build. And I think under the circumstances, I'm not trying to frustrate the, the, the building of, of supportive housing, but I think under the circumstances, the best solution would be to move it to the alternate site right now. They say they can't do that, but they can. Yeah. 
And so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. What I'm going to do is when we conclude, I'm going to move, make a motion to move in camera and we'll have a chance to you got talk it. with yep. the administration about it in private because sorry it's about that. I, yeah. it, it's a complicated issue. No, of course. So. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. You know, I, uh, it, uh, I think it probably be very unprecedented uh, for us it, it to, to direct administration in negotiations because, uh, you know, they negotiate independent of council, right? But uh, so we have to ask some legal questions around, uh, around that, right? So uh, I understand uh, Mark uh, Peckman is joining us. I don't know if they want to make a presentation or they just do answer uh, questions. Mark, so. Mark was the appraiser who... Uh, and I know he, they're online now, right? So want to see if they want to make comments. Mark? I just wanted it to be known that I'm here if you have any questions. Okay, got it, okay. Uh, okay. So you haven't sold your property yet, right? So Pardon me, I, you haven't sold your property no, yet, right? No, I have right? not, and, I, I have not, Mr. Mayor, no. And you are in negotiations with the city's real estate folks. They, yeah, there, there, there have been no negotiations. I've just been basically told this is the price that the city is willing to pay, take it or leave it. Okay, so they have their price, you have your price, that is right? Correct. And, okay, got it, okay. Yeah. okay, got it, okay. Yeah. All right, um, I want to go to uh, Susan, Susan McGee. Uh, just want to get your thoughts on uh, on the moving forward on these two projects that will, and then I'll I have this question to administration as well around uh, the capacity of the city to do other projects. Just to want to get a sense from you. Uh, these are two important projects, like so, but mm -hmm. then we'll constrain the ability for other projects. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Sure, thank you, Mayor and the committee. Um, uh, as the report outlines, I think there's been, you know, some some years now that there's been efforts to try to locate sites and these two sites in, in areas and really for supportive housing in, in neighborhoods across Edmonton. So the early identification of these sites and then, you know, the, the unfortunate uh, kind of a lot of pre-development work that resulted in those those applications, not getting the rapid housing dollars, but just there has been, um, you know, work done to try to uh, kind of assess and, and look for great locations for supportive housing. So we've been certainly excited about um, that commitment of the city and the the, the neighborhoods that that um, we would be looking at joining as a, as a project and and the communities that these are in. And that said, um, you know we are we are a partner and we have the you know certain roles along that journey. So the city has led a lot of that pre-development work um, with our support and advice. Sub, um, as well, uh, these have been projects that we've, uh, in general, you know, we've been looking as a as an organization at meeting those targets and and knowing the need for supportive housing. So trying to forecast and work in advance where our funding allocations uh, would need to be in the future, and whether the you know these these two sites are certainly opportunities that we've been already. Um, anticipating and at the same time it's you know really consistent to what the long range plan is for the community and the community plan. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh Councillor Wright, go ahead please. Oops, thank you very much. Um and Ms. McGee, I'm just wondering um timeline for development of these sites. What are we looking at? Um, administration would I think um, be able to be more specific just in terms of the actual um, completion. When we are working with um, the city of Edmonton and uh, planning ahead, we would budget, you know, kind of uh, anticipating funding supports when transfer occurs and uh, doing that RFP, we're, we're looking into a 25, 26, uh, 26, 27 budget year. And um, that gives us some lead time to plan in advance and do procurement and, and get uh, input from community and, and agencies and certainly the community plan indicating that we need a real, real variety of, um, of uh, housing for, for folks. So that's where our effort will be. But in terms of the actual construction timelines, I think administration would be better positioned to answer that. Okay. And, and what about um, funding from the, the province, operational funding and that? that would still need to be worked out or does Homer Trust have funding available? The approach that we've had with um, our 
um, service delivery plan and the funding that we receive from the provincial government is that we forecast whenever that plan is due, we forecast um, expectations in terms of our priorities over the upcoming few years. And the city has worked hard in um, advocating for supportive housing and there's been letters of support uh, for supportive housing and, and specific sites that have been tabled, whether that becomes new commitments um, or whether that's within our planned budget and a reallocation within our planned budget is the kind of thing that we determine on an annual base, basis working with uh, with our funders. Okay, so that that's still yet to sort of be determined and, and where this would sit on that priority list? Yes, and um, I, would, I would add that, you know, we've certainly looked at um, the projects that have um, opportunities to include clinical supports, not only, you know, the role of Homework Trust, but certainly some of those in-reach supports augmenting what we're able to provide as well. Okay. Awesome. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Constable. Right, Constable Jans. I would like to move in camera. Just to let 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 uh, we'll go in camera, but I just want to make sure that we have concluded questions to uh, members of the public as well as to the to the delegation. Okay, great. Uh, Constable, sorry, Constable Principe. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I do have a question about the cost per unit. Uh, I see that for Kenora, 63 studio units, it comes in at $439,000 each. Yeah. So that is to, uh, 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 to the delegation? Oh, sorry, uh, Ms. McGee. Okay, got it, okay. If, if you have any input on that. No, um, from a development perspective, similar to the uh, previous supportive housing that was undertaken, the city acting as developer and uh, committing, you know, doing the pre-development and the associated budgets and retaining the, the contractor would be the approach on this site. So that due diligence and that, that pre-planning work has occurred. I, I would just comment that like other supportive housing sites, it's difficult to really just do the math in terms of total cost, total number of units and compare it because there is uh, a large amount of space that is dedicated to staff support that needs to be netted out. So in trying to you know, do that calculation, consider that about you know, 20% of the square footage will be uh, you know, specifically to the support model, not so comparing it to you know, a regular apartment building is, uh, is um, uh, it's not it's not apples and apples. So I'm right. um, doing the math on that to something to consider. Yeah. yeah, no, and I and I do take that into consideration. I still see this as a significant amount and just wondering if there are other proponents that can do it at a lesser amount. Just I, I'm feeling that we possibly could be doing more units if we were more mm -hmm. efficient with our money. And that's that's what I just think we could be housing more people. And right, and I, and I and I appreciate um, that question because administration, acting as the developer, would have um, kind of explored those options, and I wouldn't have insight into that. And and I do intend to ask them as well, yeah. but I just wanted to get your input, your feedback, or your thoughts. Um, I did also want to ask, um, what are your thoughts on them only being studio units? You know, often when we have uh, proponents looking for grants, we're requiring them to have family suites. Um, are supportive units usually just studio or are there ever family units? Or there's should there be family units? There certainly are and we do um, have needs for uh, different uh, compositions in terms of families and, and couples. The site certainly, the, the small site as you uh, I think can see is a fairly restricted um, area in terms of the flexibility and the number of units to build on that site. I think these two sites, given that the pre-development work was also done early in the rapid housing application are also kind of, they're, they're two of many projects that we need in our community. And we certainly see the need for um, future su supportive housing projects um, developed, you know, uh, either with the city or, or other organizations working in the space, supporting um, a variety of built forms and, and a variety of needs. There's always going to be site specific decisions that get made. And I think with the size of sites, that's one of the, th the things that has really indicated the size of the units on these. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
Thank you, Constable Principe. Okay, so that concludes the questions to members of the public and to the delegation. Uh, we will go in camera now. So, Constable Jans, can you move under what? Which clauses are we going? Uh, okay. 24, uh, 25, and 27. 24, 20, yeah. 24 and? 24, 25, 27. And that will cover intergovernmental as well, if need be? Advice from officials, disclosure harmful to economic and other interests of a public body, and uh, legal advice. Okay. We can add intergovernmental if you can prefer. Can you? Because yes. I have some questions on that. Okay, good. All right. All right, so please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we'll give you a couple of minutes to ensure that only the right the people who are needed to be in, in for in, in camera discussion are available.
We are live from Chambers, Mayor Sohi. Is your mic on? It's on? Okay, good. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, we are back in public, and now we're going to go to questions to administration on item. 7.5, affordable housing site, sale of land below market value, and grant funding. Kenora and Garno. All right, questions to administration from uh, committee and council members. Okay. Maybe I'll start, right? Uh, on, I'll start with the, the uh, I know that we were all disappointed when we did not get uh, federal funding for, for uh, these two projects. We got only for one out of three that we submit, or, or city stream we got, but project stream we were not successful. So, but there are other potential opportunities, right, uh, to continue to explore with federal government, because I had a very productive meeting with Minister Fraser, and they are interested in, um, Supporting more affordable housing and supportive housing in the in the city, or are we getting any indications on whether it's budget coming up or others? Any any in, in, in inside that administration may want to share on that. Uh, thank you for the question. We uh, remain hopeful for an RHI four, pardon me, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, should get some hopefully some clarity on that uh, when the budget uh, releases shortly here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, of course, we're in constant conversations with our federal colleagues, uh, with our administrative colleagues, uh, and at the provincial government, uh, seeking opportunities, whether it be capital or funding. So uh, we continue those conversations and look to leverage that funding uh, for to optimize our city investments as well as to optimize the number of units, whether it be supportive or affordable housing here in Edmonton. Got it. You know, while we were disappointed with the federal government, but very pleased with the provincial government for providing supportive funding for these three projects, right? And We sure were. <laughs> absolutely. And, uh, and, and I understand there might be other opportunities as well, because Minister Nixon was interested, his government stepping in to fill some of the federal f funding gap, right? So there might be opportunities to continue to have a conversation with uh, his ministry. Absolutely, and we'll consider our portfolio and opportunities uh, at that time should they arise. Got it, okay. So on this specific project, uh, I just want to understand that uh, we, you're proposing to build on the two lots that city has currently acquired, right? That's correct, Mr. Mayor. And once we give approval to this, um, you would not have any need for additional space because that's what you're going to build. You're going to build what we're going to approve, and there will be no need for additional space or another 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 lot adjacent lot to uh, related to this project based on our current design 90% uh, design at this point um, the current needs for space is accommodated on our two lots that the city own okay that's what you will build and 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 uh, so I, I think it's very important to give that clarity that uh, you will build within the within the properties that city currently owns that's correct got it Okay. Uh, okay, those are the questions I had. With that, I'll go to Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you asked one of my questions about the potential funding, so thank you for that. I also, I just wanted to follow up with that. If 
if uh, the city were to be successful in obtaining um, more funding from other levels of government, what would happen to the amount, if, if this item is approved today, if this item is approved, what would happen to the amount that the city is holding? Would it go um, towards other projects in the future or what would the process be? Thanks for the question. Um, yes, th we are planning to reallocate some of those fundings that are currently being proposed today uh, if future funding is allocated for this project. Um, it will go back to our capital uh, profile, which will uh, prioritize more affordable housing and permanent supportive housing in the future. Okay, that's great. And then uh, the questions that I was asking to Ms. McGee, I would like to also ask of administration. Uh, you know, we often, for when we have uh, other ho affordable housing providers coming in front of council, we're always asking them if they are supplying family units or larger units, where all of these are studio units. Is there a reason why we're only making studio units at these er in these areas? Uh, yeah, this is Jeff Koo again from Affordable Housing and Homelessness, Councillor Principe. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the priority right now, um, as indicated from by names list and uh, other sources, where we're trying to prioritize uh, moving folks that are experiencing homelessness. And for now, that is prioritizing uh, single bedroom uh, occupancy units. Uh, in the future, we do also plan on focusing on more opportunities for family units, uh, depending on the priority populations and the core housing need groups that we're trying to support. Okay, so you're kind of going by the by, by names list as to the priorities? Uh, that is correct. We are working with Homer Trust in our design processes okay. to try and meet those needs. Good, good. And then I also have the question about the cost per unit. So I did a little bit of math again. And if I subtracted 20%, it still comes out for Kenora $352,000 for each unit, even taking off the 20%. And then Garneau was even a little bit more expensive than that. Um, is there a way that we could be, I mean, you could purchase a home for less than that, than what the uh, the cost would be for a single unit, studio unit. Is there something that we could be doing different to be more efficient? Thank you for the question. And uh, maybe I'll build upon uh, Susan McGee's comment earlier about uh, apples to oranges, which is a little bit of the case that we're talking about here. Uh, it's really difficult to compare a single family uh, home to the supportive housing. Supportive housing that we build here in the city is designed to house the hardest to house. And that means those that are coming out of homelessness and often have the highest needs uh, for supportive, supportive services around mental health, active addictions, uh, and have experienced significant physical, mental, and spiritual trauma. And so as we're designing a building, uh, there are a number of ways that that impacts the cost. So for example, uh, we may have higher grade and quality mill work for end users uh, because we see higher wear and tear of materials uh, in those units. Uh, for example, we have heavier doors for durability, staff safety, and tenant security. Uh, security and operational communications infrastructure is required, including key fob systems to enter the building and for floor access controls. Uh, there are medical rooms uh, that include locked and secured pharmaceutical supply and storage areas. We have heat treatment rooms for sanitization. There's office space for operator staff uh, that provide 24-7 tenant supports, and that includes front desk and triage. Uh, there are additional requirements, uh, for example, for HSOC, or sorry, for uh, HVAC to allow for um, daily smudging, uh, which is a common spiritual treatment. Uh, and we know that 60% of our uh, individuals experiencing homelessness are Indigenous. Uh, there's also redundant elevators for safety and care of residents at all times. So um, just naming a few here, but uh, those aren't considerations when we are looking at single family homes. Uh, but given the needs of the population that we're serving here, uh, there are additional costs uh, that get considered on a per door, but it is actually inclusive of the entire building, amenity spaces, concrete spaces, mm -hmm. and so on. Right, yeah, and that makes sense. And I, I understand that it still seems significantly higher than I think it should be. And uh, maybe that's something that we can look into the future the breakdown and what we can do to be more efficient. But thank you for those answers. Thank you, Constable Principe. 
Uh, okay, so that concludes the questions to administration. Now uh, we uh, have a, uh, can uh, Councillor Hamilton, you wanna move that? Yeah. Yes, I can move the recommendation. Can we load it up, please? There Thanks. you go. Um, I'll move uh, that executive committee recommend to city council that capital profile 1994100 affordable housing land acquisition and site development be increased by 4,248,688. To recognize the anticipated receipt of affordable housing partnership program funding from Alberta Social Housing Corporation to be spent on a multi-year basis to fund the Kenora Permanent Supportive Housing Development as outlined in Attachment 1 of the April 10, 2024 Community Services Report. Two, that the sale of land in Kenora from the City of Edmonton to Homeward Trust Holding Company in respect of the Kenora Permanent Supportive Housing Development on the terms and conditions as outlined in Attachment 2 of the April 10, 2024 Community Services Report be approved and that the agreement be in form and content acceptable to the City Manager. Three, that the affordable housing agreement between the City of Edmonton and Homeward Trust Holding Company in respect of the Kenora Permanent Supportive Housing Development on the terms and conditions as outlined in Attachment 3 of the April 10, 2024 Community Services Report be approved in a f uh, and in a form and content acceptable to the City Manager. Four, that capital profile 1994100 affordable land uh, affordable housing land acquisition and site development be increased by two million three hundred thirty seven thousand eight hundred and ten dollars to recognize the anticipated receipt of affordable housing partnership program funding from the Alberta Social Housing Corporation to be spent on a multi year basis to fund the Garneau permanent supportive housing development as outlined in attachment four of the April 10, 2024 Community Services report. Uh, five, that the sale of land in Garneau from the City of Edmonton to Homeward Trust Holding Company in respect of the Garneau Permanent Supportive Housing Development on the terms and conditions as outlined in Attachment 5 of the April 10, 2024 Community Services Report be approved and in the agreement be in form and content acceptable to the City Manager. Six, that an affordable housing agreement between the City of Edmonton and Homeward Trust Holding Company in respect of the Garneau Permanent Supportive Housing Development on the terms and conditions as outlined in Attachment 6 of the Community Services Report to be approved and the agreement be in form and content acceptable to the City Manager. Seven, that the... $11,900,000 of pay-as-you-go funding held in advance, capital profile, affordable housing, land acquisition, and site development be used to fund the Kenora and Garneau permanent supportive housing projects, and that $21,500,000 from the existing funding in capital profile 1990-4100 affordable housing, land acquisition, and site development be allocated to fund... Hmm? Sorry. Can't go any further? Allocated to fund the Kenora and Garneau per per permanent supportive housing projects. The Kenora, the Kenora and Garneau permanent supportive housing projects. No cliffhangers there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. All right. So we have motion on the floor now. Anyone to speak? Okay. Anyone to speak? If not, then. Uh, I, I go ahead. Yeah, just briefly, um, yeah. you know, wanted to wanted to thank administration uh, for for their ongoing work in this space. You know, we know acutely um, how much of a gap there is when it comes to uh, affordable and supportive housing in our city. Um, and and anytime these types of, uh, of of decisions come before us, I think it's it's really important that we move decisively, uh, given the the current and ongoing housing crisis that we're experiencing in our city. So very pleased to support this, um, and uh, look forward to to seeing the projects come to fruition. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Council Salvador. Uh, just to say a few words. First of all, uh, uh, appreciative of uh, hard work that administration has been doing in uh, finding different creative ways of uh, moving forward on uh, on these projects. Uh, there are a few things I want to highlight. One of them is uh, 
that if there were better coordination between all three orders of government, we can actually move these projects faster. What I am, what I experience is that, you know, because there are different funders, we federal, provincial, municipal, and they are not sitting at the same table. Because they're not sitting at the same table, their approval project is very disjointed. Uh, you get money from one order of government, you don't get money from the other, or you get it a year later. If there was a better coordination, we can build faster. And, uh, and maybe build cheaper as well, because it reduces more time we wait, more cost we, we add. Uh, I think we need to improve that. I think we brought that up with uh, Minister Nixon and Mr. Fraser in my, uh, in my meeting with them, and uh, hopefully they're open to that conversation. I think this also a very strong indication from this council that the housing emergency that we declared, we are stepping up in our role to, uh, to fulfill our responsibility because housing is a shared responsibility uh, of the province, feds, and, and municipality. And this is significant investment that uh, Edmontonians are making uh, to help the most vulnerable Edmontonians to find them a place and uh, give them uh, uh, the sense of security and safety that people need when they struggle. Uh, and this really speaks to the compassion that Edmontonians have for each other and, uh, and they're stepping up through their property taxes uh, to uh, provide that support uh, to uh, build more homes for Edmontonians uh, who need those homes. Uh, so this is a very, very good investment. I am optimistic uh, that we will be able to secure more funding, both from the provincial government and from the federal government, to build more affordable housing in, in, in our city. Um, if there's one area, there's, uh, 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 I would say, more collaboration, that is an area that we are actually seeing results. And I absolutely was disappointed and continue to be disappointed that we were not able to get funding for these two projects from the federal government. But I also want to acknowledge that the federal government also helped build us close to 600 affordable, sorry, supportive housing unions through RHI, RHI 1 and 2 and look forward to future conversation with them in, um, if there's another stream of uh, rapid housing initiative uh, through the budget. And again, with Minister Nixon as well, you know, they have been stepping up on shelters, they have stepping up on, um, on housing, and they have added more money uh, in, the, in the last budget uh, uh, for housing, and we look forward to, to those uh, opportunities, opportunities as well, right? So and with that, uh, I will go to Councillor Hamilton to close. Nothing more to add, thank you. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Our next item is 7-6, single source request, Canadian Red Cross for Emergency Response Services. It was selected by Councillor Wright. We'll go to uh, administration for a presentation if there is any. Mayor Sohi, I don't necessarily need a presentation. I just have a few questions. Just in case, you know, for okay. our folks from fire services I want to say a few words. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good yeah. morning, everyone. So I'm Deputy Chief Dave Lazenby, and with me online today is Fire Chief Satilney, Assistant Deputy Chief of Emergency Management and Communications, Ryan Tanowski, and Le Linda Hugh from Legal Services. Administration is recommending the approval of an agreement with the Canadian Red Cross for up to $9 million to support the 2024 wildfire season response. As a major municipality, Edmonton manages both its wildfire risk and response to calls for assistance through the Emergen Alberta Emergency Management Agency on behalf of mun municipalities throughout the province. Anticipating a hot and dry spring and summer, we are finalizing the planning for the 2024 wildfire season response 
Our approach will be relayed to Council and the public once approved by the Interim City Manager as the Director of the, the Emergency Management Agency. In 2023, we spent 8.7 million on services from the Red Cross that were 100% recoverable from the province. Based on available information from the province, we anticipate that there is a strong probability that we'll need a similar amount for 2024. A proactive agreement with the Canadian Red Cross sets the terms and conditions for anticipated work, but does not commit the city to spend these funds. If the agreement is leveraged to support a response requested by the Government of Alberta, the City of Edmonton recoups these costs through the Provincial Disaster Recovery Programme. By leveraging the expertise, capacity and reliability of the Canadian Red Cross, administration will be prepared to address evacuee needs when called upon to do so by the Government of Alberta. And we welcome any questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright, you exempted this. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I didn't get my name on the list there. I'm sorry. Um, so, um, Deputy Chief, thank you very much for, for that information. The the 8.7 that was spent in 2023, does that include, um, that's just for Red Cross. That doesn't include like what our city staff and, and resources like the Expo Centre that we've spent on? On this, is that correct? That that's correct. From memory, I think the total spend was was in in the region of thirteen million. The eight point seven million was purely Red Cross related expenditure. Okay, and and have we been reimbursed for that by the province yet? I... So. Yeah, Councillor, I can I can step in. Um, to date, everything that we can be reimbursed from the the province uh, has been recovered. I believe there are some costs that are that are uh, um, outstanding from the city of Edmonton, uh, such as um, the goods and kind services and some regular staff time uh, that was um, uh, utilized that really doesn't fall under the recovery program. But um, to date, and and we can we will double check that. But that's my knowledge. Okay, but that but the eight point seven for for Red Cross that's been reimbursed, or no, I, is I, that? I would, I would say not yet. I'm just looking at some some more notes here, Councillor Wright. Um, we've received. So then, where do we get the money from in the interim, awaiting? So the maybe I'll jump in and answer this. Thank so you, Ms. Packard. When we do um, when we do these programs. The way it works is the city uses our own cash to to pay for the items to necessitate being able to take the action. Claims are submitted to the province from the originating uh, municipality. We claim we submit our stuff, and the reimbursement takes time. So, I, Mr. perhaps Mr. Lazenby has what we've been what we've recovered to date. But the reimbursement takes time. I would, I would just caution that the timing of the reimbursement is different, a different issue than, and is a non-issue. What matters is that we ultimately get the recovery from yeah. the province. But it does require some time for them to be able to validate the claims from the muni multiple agencies involved. Okay. And, it, and it's not just province of Alberta, like, I mean, because last year it was also the Northwest Territories, right? So it's, it's both both provinces that we're waiting on, or? That's correct, Councillor. There, there are um, there are still some from last year, some, some outstanding that we're still working through. Okay. And we do believe most of it will be covered, though. Okay, and 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 Ms. Padbury, just going back when you said we use our own cash, so there is there is funds in some budget line to help cover this in the interim. No, it's not in your like we put it we put it in the budget as an expense, and we put it in the budget as a recovery. In okay. the interim, we use our cash until we recover. So it's an accounts receivable for us. It's a longer term. Uh, like it takes, it's longer than our traditional accounts receivable, but that's how we deal with it. Okay. So have we been reimbursed for 2022? I, I don't have that information, uh, okay. Councillor Wright. Okay. And then and I guess then my other question is, why isn't this contract 
done like I I appreciate the services that the Red Cross provides and all their expertise in that but why isn't the contract then done directly through Red Cross in the province why are we kind of the middleman that, that that's a fair observation councillor right um we we met with the Red Cross uh, a few weeks ago to discuss this this very agreement and that's something that they're looking at for themselves right now the disaster recovery program requires the impacted municipality to be the one point of contact to get that um, reimbursement of expenditure and we kind of you know invoice the affected municipality inclusive of the costs of the Red Cross and any other services that we've um, procured um, we, we get reimbursed that way but ultimately there's one person requesting money from the province but the Red Cross are looking at the opportunity or potential for directly billing and taking us out the equation we'd still work together but the financial okay. aspect of it would be on other people um i can't promise that i was not part of the conversation but if you can work your magic please do <laughs> okay all right thank you very much i just yeah you know like i said i don't understand why we're the middleman but um yeah i, I think the services that that we do provide um through the expo center um yeah, it helps to support all of our neighbors, um, both within and, and, and outside the province. So thank you for your, everybody's work on this. Appreciate it. That's thank all you. the questions I thank have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Jans. My questions are answered as just removing myself. Okay. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the proactive approach here. Uh, makes makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I guess I just wanted to use this opportunity. This, this covers us for 2024, which is great. Um, I'm thinking about where we go from here. Um, recognizing the, that we can anticipate to see an elevated risk, unfortunately, I think for, for years to come um, on an ongoing basis. So just wondering, you know, do we need to have a larger conversation about climate related emergency management? You, I think unfortunately you're correct, Council, Councillor Salvador. Um, you know, and I think I've said in, in meetings where we, we've attended together, I think we're a municipality and, and not it's not exclusive or unique to us that's in transition. We, we recognize now that you know, climate related emergencies are gonna happen and happen more frequently and maybe more severely. And, and we are in that transition mode and recognizing that and planning for the eventuality of those situations. There's a lot, a lot of work going on right across the city um, to prepare for that. We'll be providing council with a, an update memo to give you hopefully confidence and reassurance that this is take, being taken seriously. Um, there's a large media unveil next week. You will be part of the communication plan, just giving you a heads up there. To, um, we, we value the opportunity that you have to kind of connect with residents. There's a piece there for residents to help them prepare and reduce the risk for themselves. And we see you as a key conduit um, and connection point for us. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of work being done and, and you'll see that coming out in the next few weeks. But I think this is only the start, unfortunately. It's going to be part and parcel of um, you know daily life for us now. As an urban centre, we didn't have to contend or contemplate that to the degree that we are now, but we recognise that and we're taking that responsibility seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I appreciate that and uh, look forward to that memo coming forward so that we can help communicate some of that work as well. And, and I guess would that include uh, some of the work that's underway around um, wildfire hazard and risk management, vegetation management, fire smart, um, all of those bodies of work? All of those things. The, the, our, the city's parks division is doing great work um, on, on the vegetation management. They're recognizing the need to be more proactive. They're hiring a wildfire technician for 11 months. They've done risk assessments for the whole city. And so, you know, they're, they're prepared. They've, they've got the data, they've got the information that drives their work. And it also helps us as to where we, you know, maybe target certain things. We've got a relationship now with the University of Alberta. We're doing exposure assessments. That will help with our response. Um, you know, if there is a, a wildfire in the river valley and it kind of threatens to breach the river valley and get into a, a neighborhood, um, that will help inform us as from our firefighting tactics perspective. Okay, excellent. Um, and maybe just final question. Uh, it sounds like a lot of excellent work is underway. Do you need anything from council at this point to support you in these efforts? No, I, I, I know that you are, you're heavily invested in this and, and we, we appreciate that support. Like I say, look, look out for the media unveil next week and also the councillor toolkits that come your way and please utilise them. We, we, I'm not just saying it, we genuinely see you as a, 
a necessary asset in our communications plan and we want to get the, the messaging out to as many of Edmontonians as we can. So you're a key part of that. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for that and waiting, uh, look forward to the memo and also opportunity that we can engage with Edmontonians because I worry, I worry a lot about uh, uh, climate change absolutely impacting this and we are facing very dry conditions. So I really worry about 2024 uh, as well into the future as well. So I just want to get it. So I look forward to that memo because I want to, we want to make sure that Edmontonians understand that we are prepared, right? So does this contract that we are signing with Red Cross, yes, it helps uh, provide services to people who are being displaced outside of the city coming into the city, but it also prepares us in our own response to needs of Edmontonians if that need be, right? So I think a number, number of pieces there, Mr. Mayor. The, release, the agreement with the Red Cross helps us kind of facilitate reception centres for whomever needs them, whether that's Edmontonians or people from outside. Traditionally, right. okay. it's, it's been from people outside of the city and, and at times the province. Yeah. Um, but if in the event that people are displaced more locally, yeah. we will have the ability to set up a reception centre and the support mechanisms in place to help people locally too. And this uh, allows you to set it up rapidly, right? Having this yes. proactively engaged with having this contract with Red Cross. Yes. Like you're not waiting for something to happen, then sign a contract, you're proactively signing so you can deploy it as quickly as possible. Yeah, the, the la I think you'd well understand the last thing we need in, in the time of response is to be caught up in administrative yeah. bureaucracy and process. Um, and we just want to get these things out of the way ahead of the wildfire season. Got it, got it, okay. Yeah, let us know how we can help because I hear a lot of concerns from the community, particularly people. Like we, ha I think we have the largest urban forest in Edmonton compared to any other municipality in North America that I have last I heard, right? So, uh, and we need to protect that urban forest, but urban forest is prone to fires during when it's pretty dry conditions, right? So, and Edmontonians are worried about that too. So we need to be prepared. Yeah, okay, great. So look forward to that. Okay, that's it. Uh, uh, Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. I just wanted to move the recommendation in the report. Okay. So that uh, single source agreement between the City of Edmonton and the Canadian Red Cross Society for a one-year term commencing on April 15th, 2024, and for an amount not to exceed $9 million, including GST, for the provision of emergency shelter and support services, as outlined in the April 10th, 2024 Office of the City Manager Report, EFRS 02433, be approved, and that the agreement be in a form and content acceptable to the City Manager. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So we have motion on the floor. Anyone to speak? Yes, if no one else is. Uh, I see no one else. So please go ahead, uh, Councillor Wright, to close. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I do appreciate all, all the work that our, our city um, emergency services and administration services does um, and in, in helping to sort of um, Cover, cover off this this work um, as we we help out our our neighbors both in and out of province um, and I think the discussion in regards to the impact of the climate crisis um, we were we were into that on our um, January 23rd uh, emergency advisory committee meeting and uh, I hope that we can continue that discussion uh, when that meeting reconvenes so um, Thank you to, to all those in our emergency management services um, for, again, helping to assist our neighbours both in and outside of the province. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So we have uh, cross-referenced item 717273 uh, that we will deal with at 1.30. Uh, but are there any, we don't have any responses to consular inquiries. We don't have any private support remaining, no motions pending. Maybe I'll entertain at this time if there are any notes or motions or motions without customary notice. 
Okay, we don't have any, so we'll be back at uh, 1 30 uh, to deal with those uh, remaining items. Until then, we are on recess.
We are live from Council Chambers. Okay, hello everyone. I would like to call this meeting back to order and uh, do a roll call of committee members. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. And I will go through the list, see if other council members are joining us. Uh, oops. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Okay, that is for now. And we are on to our Time specific item for 13071 Nighttime Economy Strategy Evaluation Framework and Performance Measures, cross referenced with 0 0.72 and 73, Destination Marketing Attraction Activities by City Funded Entities, as well as Edmonton Sport and Cultural Attraction Plan. We'll go to administration for our presentation. Good afternoon, members of committee. My name is Alyssa La Liberty, and I'm the branch manager of Economic Investment Services. I'm joined by Jennifer Flamen, Deputy City Manager of Community Services, and Roger Jevney, branch manager of Community Recreation and Culture, along with other members of administration for questions. With us remotely today, actually, she's here, I've seen her, Tracy Bednard, Paul Haas, Janelle Janis, and Shelley Gralmus from Explore Edmonton. So do you want to invite them to be part of the delegation? Yes, then to the that front? would be great. I think Tracy's here. I'm not sure if the yeah. others are. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. The three reports are being presented collectively today because of their relevance to explore Edmonton's <coughs> mandate and the potential positive impact on Edmonton's tourism sector and explore Edmonton's tourism master plan. These reports showcase the diverse ways that Explore Edmonton fulfills its mandate and also demonstrates the various touch points that Explore has with the city and stakeholders in the visitor economy. Next slide, please. Tourism is a significant economic engine for Edmonton. Over 80% of Edmonton residents believe tourism positively impacts Alberta, economic diversity, and our community. In 2019, tourism-related spending was nearly $2 billion, with just over 6 million visitors to Edmonton annually, supporting thousands of jobs and hundreds of small to medium-sized businesses. However, visitor spending levels in Edmonton are not expected to reach pre-pandemic levels until 2026. This is due to higher spending market segments, such as business travelers and international travelers, expected to recover more slowly. Nevertheless, visitor spending is still forecast to grow by more than 50% above 2019 levels by the end of the decade. Edmonton offers residents and visitors alike access to sporting events, world-recognized festivals, culinary experiences, meetings and convention attractions, outdoor adventures, and access to Edmonton's River Valley, the largest urban park in Canada. These activities spur economic benefits while providing visitors with opportunities to learn and discover Edmonton's unique history, nature, and diverse cultures. Explore Edmonton is the city's destination management and marketing organization, focused on increasing the visitor-based economic impact on the local economy. In 2022, Explore Edmonton activities generated $182 million in direct economic impact. In fulfilling their mandate, Explore Edmonton works with a variety of stakeholders, including its sole shareholder, the City of Edmonton. Over the past two years, that have been, there have been ongoing conversations about the activities of Explore Edmonton and the budget required to deliver on those expectations, while also managing economic challenges such as post-COVID recovery, inflation, facility operations and maintenance, and wildfire emergency response. 
Some of the recent Explore Edmonton discussions and discuss decisions by councils leading up to today's presentation include on February 12th, City Council approved one-time funding of just over $6 million to be used to fund Explore Edmonton's operating expenses and base operations. This funding will support Explore in fulfilling their mandate and provide support as other decision items unfold. Then on February 21st, City Council approved tax forgiveness of approximately $1.1 million. And additionally, an unfunded service package is making its way to Spring Soba to increase Explore's operational funding by $6 million in 2025 on an ongoing basis and to consider the integration of sports activities in Expo Centre Halls A, B and C. This brings us to today where we're gonna focus on destination marketing, marketing activities, the nighttime economy strategy, and an update on the sport and cultural action plan. First, we'll start with an update on the destination marketing activities by Explore Edmonton and other city funded agencies. Next slide, please. Destination marketing is a core piece of Explore Edmonton's mandate. Assessment of these activities has provided clarity on the roles for those working in this realm and confirmed that a shared funding model is not recommended. Instead, opportunities have been identified to optimize current destination marketing actions through improved coordination, targeted promotion, and curation of unique experiences for visitors. New direction or additional funding is not required to implement the opportunities identified. Next slide. We'll now turn our attention to the nighttime econ economy strategy. Next slide, please. Vibrant cities attract people to visit, live, work, and invest in them. Nightlife ranks eight for attracting people to a municipality and first for attracting startups. Creating a dynamic, well-designed and accessible urban experience is one of the strategic goals of Explore Edmonton's tourism master plan. The plan recommends setting a clear vision and direction for the development of Edmonton's nighttime economy. A healthy, vibrant nighttime economy can lead to improved perceptions of Edmonton overall. This helps attract more visitors, encourage more Edmontonians to participate in our city's nightlife and drive investment. Therefore, a thriving nighttime economy can help to attract more entrepreneurs and startup businesses, growing Edmonton's non-residential tax base. Nighttime economic activity supports businesses and provides employment to many Edmontonians. Based on findings from the 2023 Business Census pilot, there are 795 businesses operating in Ward or Damon that can be considered part of the nighttime economy, representing 17.8% of the total businesses in the ward. These businesses provide nearly 12,000 jobs, which is about 11% of the ward's employment. Research con conducted by Nighttime Economy Solutions, the consultant that wrote the Nighttime Economy Strategy, indicates that cities that have invested in nightlife have observed rates of return of approximately $6 for every dollar invested, and for our investment in arts, culture, and music alone, the return on investment is approximately $4 for every dollar spent. Next slide, please. Key findings from the research and engagement about Edmonton's nighttime economy show that over 80% of survey respondents go out in Edmonton during the hours of 5 p.m. and 6 a.m. During this time frame, consumers visit restaurants the most and they like the choice of things to do in Edmonton. Although there is a high number of survey respondents who explore Edmonton's nighttime economy, approximately 56% raise concerns about safety. When asked to prioritize the top three improvements they would like to make in Edmonton at night, most respondents rank, ranked houselessness and a lack of visible support for this community as their top priority. Communication and collaboration were identified as an area of improvement within the city, with community members and underrepresented groups, and with consumers of the nighttime economy. Creating transparency, clarity, efficiency and meaningful engagement creates opportunities for increasing the number and types of organizations operating. It also increases numbers of consumers exploring our nighttime economy and uncovering further economic development opportunities. Lighting was found to be a key component for helping to wayfind, improve aesthetics and give a heightened sense of safety at night. Meanwhile, public transportation at night was perceived to be inconvenient and unsafe in some instances. These findings demonstrate that there is current use and demand for nighttime eco economy activities by consumers and that there is still room for growth and improvement. It is important to note that this work was conducted in early 2023, over one year ago. Perceptions about Edmonton experiences may have shifted since the audit and stakeholder engagements were completed. As the city has advanced actions to, uh, since that time, the city has advanced actions to improve transit, safety, security, and cleanliness. 
Since the release of the council report, we have also heard that some stakeholders, including our BIAs, would have liked more engagement on the nighttime economy strategy. BIAs, as well as other stakeholders, are key partners for growing Edmonton's nighttime economy, and should committee decide to move forward on the recommendation, we will ensure further engagement is included in next steps. Next slide. The strategy itself contains seven recommendations supported by 59 implementation actions to address the findings from the research and engagement. Administration has assessed these actions to understand the current state and potential next steps if they were to be implemented. 58% of these actions reflect work underway by the city or within the community while the remaining 42% are not underway through city work or through a recognized community function at this time. The report contains a full list of the actions and the corresponding areas of work that are in alignment with each action. The city and partners have already invested significantly in some of the actions that overlap with existing city priorities. However, these actions aren't currently integrated or connected under a sim singular uh, framework. Next slide. Should Council decide um, to implement the nighttime economy strategy, we would recommend beginning with establishing a nighttime economy lead and the accompany accompanying nighttime economy alliance. The nighttime economy lead is important to ensure that integration, communication and collaboration and implementation of all the actions occur. This role would ensure a nighttime perspective continues within existing work and duplication is avoided with new actions. This position is recommended to be within administration to best navigate the interaction between existing and new actions. Both the Nighttime Economy Lead and Nighttime Economy Alliance are action oriented, meaning their focus is on implementation of the strategy to create the greatest impact in Edmonton's nighttime economy. The Nighttime Economy Alliance will help Edmonton prioritize the actions not already underway and will look to use existing resources to implement new actions where possible. As the nighttime economy changes, the Nighttime Economy Alliance will also serve as a mechanism to incorporate emerging priorities as a means to remain relevant to the needs of Edmonton's nighttime economy. By implementing this approach, we expect to have more integrated growth in our nighttime economy, continuous improvement through feedback from business and the community, and the ability to be responsive to a dynamic business and community environment. Next slide, please. We will now provide an update on the work that has been done to refresh Edmonton's Sport and Cultural Attraction Plan in response to the November 21st motion passed by City Council. Administration and Explore Edmonton, who collaborate to bring major sport and cultural events to the city, work with Sport Edmonton, previously the Edmonton Sport Council, to complete this update. Once the action plan is updated, it will be shared with Council via memo. Collectively, these representatives reassess the sport, tourism environment, and how event attraction supports the city's goals. In doing this work, they also looked at what is needed to keep Edmonton being a key player in Canada's lucrative sport tourism industry and an attractive destination for marketing and branding purposes. The report before you today deals primarily with major sports events such as the recent NHL Heritage Classic and International Basketball Federation's 3-on-3 three -three Masters or the upcoming Red Bull Soapbox race. It also speaks to the level of event considered mega, which categorizes events like the Olympics, FIFA World Cup or Commonwealth Games. These events may follow a similar process, but do require additional levels of council consideration and investment. This is not administration's current focus. Also, I wanna note that local festivals and events, music, concerts, conferences, or trade shows are out of scope of this work. You have probably noticed that the name of the plan has been updated to the major sport event strategic framework to reflect that the majority of these opportunities fall within the sports industry. This does not preclude us from pursuing cultural hosting opportunities such as the Junos or the Canadian Country Music Awards which coincidentally, it was announced yesterday that the 2024 edition of the CCMAs that will be held in Edmonton on September 14th will be co-hosted by Thomas Rett and Mackenzie Porter. I never want to miss an opportunity to toot our own horn around here. Next slide, please. Event and sport event tourism is one of the fastest growing sectors in the tourism industry. Events bring in new economic opportunities for the community, new business for the businesses in it, and new opportunities for the people who live there. It has been argued that if a community is not continuously bringing in new money and new opportunities, it is a formula for failure and a sign of a community on the decline. Events are part of Edmonton's DNA. The 1978 Commonwealth Games was our breakthrough moment, sparking our city's passion for major events. Since then, we have steadily built a reputation for being one of Canada's leading and best host cities. 
It is often said that Edmonton punches above its weight in hosting events, an achievement that is no small feat given how competitive event hosting has become. Events allow Edmonton to be talked about in the same conversation with other world-class cities in a way few other initiatives do. We have consistently been ranked in the top 40 international sports city as a major event host ahead of cities like Amsterdam, Sydney, and Vancouver. In 2023, we were the second highest ranked Canadian city behind only Toronto. Our outcomes are measured in economic impacts, social benefits, and building our city's brand. For example, in 2023, the city supported eight major attracted events, generating 72 million in economic impact in one year alone. We've enjoyed this success largely because of what Edmonton, what makes Edmonton the city it is. We are great collaborators. Our volunteers are second to none. We have skilled event producers. Our community gets behind events and we are committed to inclusivity so all Edmontonians can participate. Next slide, please. So how do we maintain success in such a competitive arena? It starts with a solid foundation of municipal, su municipal support. Council formally recognized the significant benefits that major international events could offer in 2018 when it approved the events policy and strategy, strategy to better guide event hosting in the city. These documents follow recommendations in the Changing Field of Play report authored by members of the Citizens Panel on major events. More recent strategic documents endorse the valuable role that events play in helping to build an economically diverse, tourism-friendly, inclusive, and vibrant city. The hosting of major events is specifically mentioned as a goal in the city plan, as strategic investments in the economic action plan, and is a critical element of the tourism master plan and visitor economy. Events are also a key driver in the downtown, downtown vibrancy strategy, bringing vibrancy to the city's core while also contributing to economic return and perceptions of public safety. I will now hand it over to Roger Demney to walk through the updates that have been made. So as per the direction and council's motion, administration worked with Sport Edmonton to convene a meeting of the major sport events stakeholders, as well as Sport Edmonton, members of the administration, and Councillor Cartmel as council's liaison to Sport Edmonton. During the meeting, there was an acknowledgement that Edmonton does a good job in bringing events to the city. It was recognized that the vision, mission, and objectives from the 2018 plan remain relevant. It was also acknowledged that the city of Edmonton and Explore Edmonton's collaborative process from the bid stage to the delivery of the event has proven to be an effective model. The approach we use is seen as the gold standard in the events world across Canada. And while current efforts appear to be working well, we recognize the importance of being nimble and adaptable to changing circumstances and we increase and increase competition. So we welcome the timely opportunity to revisit our approach. And as part of that effort, there were some ideas where we identified that clarity could be beneficial. Next slide, please. Some of the areas that we updated are noted on this slide. We've completed an international environmental scan. We clarified the governance model. We mapped the events consideration process and updated the roles and responsi responsibilities of the key players in this process, including a new and expanded role for Sport Edmonton as community advocates and engagers. We outlined the types of events that we've pursued, reoccurring events which allow Edmonton to hold a place in the international calendar and provide the opportunity for repeat visitation and foster community connection and developmental opportunities. And also one-time or marquee events that allow ent entry into trending sports, provide larger economic benefits and maybe one over a certain period, over a certain time frame. An example would be an NHL All-Star game or the multi-sport triathlon world championships. And we revised our event evaluation scorecard to support efficient and clear evaluation, factoring in questions relating to our three key areas of benefits in economic, social, and reputational. And it's important to note that this process takes place over an extended period of time, with events often being identified and requiring commitments several years in advance. Our events roadmap must be proactive, strategic, and flexible. And to achieve this effectively, we rely on sustainable and stable funding. Next slide, please. Funding has been one of the biggest challenges many event producers have experienced in the city recent years, with organizers often experiencing reduced levels of funding and increased expenses. This comes at a time when a competition for events is increasing in Canada and globally, and events are having to do more to provide a safe and inclusive environment for all participants and the community. This is why the strategic framework highlights the need to have sustainable and appropriate funding from the city. This is vitally important to ensure that Edmonton remains an attractive host for these events and also allows us to leverage city resources with the other orders of government and corporate sponsorships. It bears repeating that in 2023 alone, the city supported those eight major attracted events, receiving a total of 1.3 million in provincial funding and in turn generating 72 million in economic impact. As per council's direction, administration will bring forward an unfunded service package during SOBA discussions later this month. Slide please. In closing, the hosting of events is one of Edmonton's strengths, and it is an important part of our city's identity. 
We are confident the updates we have made to the strategic framework will help us streamline this work and are grateful to our key stakeholders, such as the Sport Edmonton. As was noted earlier, the action plan is being finalized and once complete will be provided to Council by memo. Major international events give us a unique opportunity. We must ensure that these efforts continue in order to capture our share of sport tourism that brings valuable economic, reputational, and social benefits to our community. We either set ourselves up for success or we step aside and allow other cities to reap the benefits. Thank you and would please to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. We have a number of uh, folks joining us to uh, uh, share their comments and views with us on this item. And uh, I would also la like to add Katie Ingram to that list. Uh, so if we could please vote to add Katie to the list. We are just waiting for two votes. Slave Jans and Hamilton. Oh, in favor. Thank you. We have all the votes. Okay, display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll call the names, and so please come down. Uh, Panita McBrien, Edmonton Downtown Business Association, joining its person. Panita, if you come down, will be speaker number one. Sherry Klassen, Old Strathcona Business Association, joining remotely, speaker number two. And speaker number three, Lauren Farnell, in person. Lauren? You'll be number three, Lauren. Dan Mason, joining remotely. Dan, are you there? Nope. Yes, I'm here. Oh, Sorry. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay Harrison, do North events in person? Lindsay, let me number five. Nolan Thiessen, explore Edmonton. Maybe they were to be part of delegation, right? So... Not, no, they're not here, okay. Uh, Todd James, Edmonton's BIA Council, joining, I saw Todd in person, not remotely. Todd, there, you're there, okay. Thank you. Brent Oliver, in person. Brent, you'll be number, speaker number eight. Sorry, seven. Uh, seven. Well, uh, David, Lamonton, joining remotely. David, are you there? No. Uh, Anna Marie Petrov, Fran Francis Winsper Center for music in person. No, you're not speaking? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hannah Choi, Francis Winsper Center for music in person. No? Oh. You're welcome to say a few words. It's okay. No? Uh, Brian Christensen, joining remotely. Hello, I'm here. Thank you. Ryan Bird, joining remotely. I'm here. I'm here. And Katie Ingram. Katie, can you please come down? Okay. Each of you will have five minutes to make your presentation. And after you have concluded your presentation, then committee members and council members may have questions to you. So please remain seated. But before we begin our discussion, I want to share our collective expectations for the conduct of everyone participating to ensure a safe and inclusive environment and workplace. These expectations apply equally to both in-person and virtual attendees. Hearing from the public is an important part of Council's process to ensure we hear the full diversity of opinions that exists within our community. 
As meeting chair, I have a responsibility to ensure the safety of all participants in today's meeting. As part of that responsibility, inappropriate comments or gestures will not be tolerated. If they occur, I will direct the clerk to immediately remove anyone engaging in such behavior. The type of behavior that will result in the removal from the meeting includes making dis disrespectful comments directed at individual staff members or other public speakers or using profane language. Responsive behaviors to show support or dissent, such as shouting, cheering, clapping, or using the chat or emotional response features in Google Meet are not permitted. I will not provide any additional warnings and once removed, once removed the person will not be permitted to rejoin the meeting. This meeting is being live streamed and everyone is welcome to view the live stream online. Again, my role as chair is not to moderate the nature of the, um, nature of the content being discussed, but to ensure chamber behaviors are maintained to support a safe, respectful and neutral space for my colleagues, city employees and the public. I thank everyone in advance for your respectful participation in today's discussion. So with that, we'll go to our first public speaker, Benita McBride, please go ahead. Hello everyone, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Benita McBride, I'm the CEO of the Edmonton Downtown Business Association. I'm here today to reiterate how important a strong nighttime economy is for the future of our downtown and for the success of our city. While our current member base downtown is less than 10% nighttime businesses, those businesses have an outsized importance to the overall vibrancy and attractiveness of our downtown. Our existing nighttime business mix is primarily centered on food and alcohol, live music venues, and cultural spaces. These are almost across the board, small, locally owned businesses that are struggling to stay afloat and keep their staff and themselves paid and who are nowhere near any kind of profitability. We're just very recently seeing a small handful of restaurants begin to offer late night hours again, uh, and most have still not resumed late night service since the pandemic. A strong nighttime econom economy is primarily a strong arts and cultural economy. There's tremendous work being done in other cities that we could look to in this area, including Calgary's creative economy strategy, led by the Edmonton Arts Council, or, or, sorry, Calgary Arts Development, uh, and Calgary Economic Development, and Toronto's work around their music industry and cultural spaces. While we do incredible work and punch above our weight on attracting national and international cultural and sporting events, Edmonton is very far behind on the critical local economic as development aspect of this work, and we don't do nearly enough to support businesses in the arts and cultural sector and our diverse festivals and public events that really make up the heart and soul of our nighttime economy and much of our local economic vibrancy as a whole. Unfortunately, I also have to address today our deep disappointment with the work done on the so-called nighttime economy strategy that's in front of you, attachment two. Um, city administration uh, mentioned earlier that uh, groups had concerns about engagement, including BIAs. To, to correct that statement, we, we do not take issue with the engagement that was done. I think there was really robust engagement done on this um, project. I think that's where the good work ended, unfortunately, on this project. Um, it's, it's not a nighttime economy strategy. It's a, maybe a report and a preliminary analysis at best. Um, and it's a poorly written one at that. The contents are bizarrely and unethically presented. Data is incomplete and misleading. And many sections are, to me, and I used to do work like this for a living, um, largely indefensible and unusable. I wanna to touch on a couple of specific sections in the report that are really relevant to the work of the EDBA. One is about the importance of new and innovative approaches to safety, and the other is about the promotion and marketing of nighttime businesses and events. I don't have time in my remarks right now to get into specifics of, of the work that we're doing in those two areas, but one of the disappointing things to us is that there was no mention made of, I think, really uh, exciting work that we're doing in those areas. Um, and so, again, one of, one of many things that we were disappointed with in, in what was presented in that report. Happy to chat more if, if any councillors have any questions. Despite um, the deeply concerning and disappointing work on the strategy, um, we don't want to see the overall prioritization of a strong nighttime economy get derailed. We do believe this work is so important and continuing this work is so important. Um, lastly, I want to emphasize um, 
and, and some of this is presented in the report, but much of the work that needs to be done must be about getting the basics right of a strong city, a strong business district, we were talking about Old Strathcona or downtown or other areas, um, and just getting the basics right. Making sure that our street lights are functioning on every block. Managing litter on the street overnight. Sidewalk maintenance. Something like nighttime ambassadors, which again, we're, we're kind of behind on. Generally creating an environment where customers feel safe and confident and comfortable to walk around at night. That's some of the most critically important and high impact work that could be done. Uh, and I do fear a little bit that some of the action plan recommendations um, won't have that immediate impact that I think some of those basic things could. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, uh, next we'll go to Sherry Klassen. Hello. Thank you for having me today. My name is Cherie Clausen. I'm the executive director and colleague uh, to Panita. I'm the executive director of the Old Strathcona Business Association. Uh, we represent about 500 businesses, many of which are part of the nighttime economy and a well-known district for its nightlife. I'll reiterate a lot of what Panita has said. Uh, I really want to state that investing in our nighttime economy is absolutely vital to the health and vitality of our main street districts and the city, just like White Ave. The industry is changing and likely going to continue to need to change from simply just bars and nightclubs being the main nighttime ent enter entertainment. COVID showed us that people have an appetite to experience the outdoors at nighttime and in new ways. Uh, and I see so many opportunities for our city to embrace and build that culture um, from the artistic side of the, of the industry in the evening. Uh, myself, one of my staff members, as well as Panita from the DBA, were on the steering committee for the nighttime economy strategy. And as Panita said, we were, we were heavily engaged. We were really excited that the city was finally investing in this work and really curious to see what kind of new strategies and recommendations would come out. We had high hopes. And I will also reiterate, we were very, very disappointed with the outcome and the contents of the report. It's not a strategy, it's an audit and a report of current state with some recommendations on next steps. I was hoping for some real practical and strategic projects to be recommended, but instead we got a report of stuff that reinforces a lot of what we already know uh, and what we already do as BIAs to try to improve some of that infrastructure and experience. In addition, on page 22, BIAs are portrayed in a very negative light from a firm that isn't even from Canada, nor seems to understand the work that our BIAs do. We entered this committee as partners, working collaboratively as we always do with various stakeholders in the city and the fact that BIAs were being assessed as a business engagement team was inappropriate and inaccurate. In addition, the statistics related to the business satisfaction with BIAs included in that report is, an accurate, uh, is not an accurate portrayal of the data that was collected. And we wanna ask that that data be reviewed and amended as it doesn't meet Canadian market research standards for ethical reporting. The work we do do as BAs is directly, directly related to supporting the nighttime economy. In Old Strathcona, we invest tens of thousands of dollars every year on street pressure walk washing, litter pickup. Uh, in addition, we're constantly advocating for seven day a week policing, a creation of a street outreach team, an ambassador team, uh, and always advocating for things like fixing lighting and sidewalks, as many of you are already aware. As the report highlights, safety is a big concern, as well as cleanliness and waste management. These are all concerns BIAs have been raising for several years and advocating for, but it's not really mentioned anywhere in the report that we do this work. We'd like to see something as simple as Finia said, getting lighting fixed, making it safer at night for people to walk around the city. Um, we're regularly reporting these things to 311 uh, and it's very unsafe for our pedestrians at night and crossing. These are small things our city can do right now to improve the experience of the nighttime in our city. We do see incredible value in the nighttime uh, economy strategy moving forward and the development of some sort of nighttime mayor or coordinator and an alliance. And so much like Panita said, despite some of the things that were in the report, we do support m work going forward. We see that there's a real lack of focus and skill set in the nighttime economy right now. Uh, and we've heard from stakeholders in the industry that they really wanna see a commitment from the city to attend those meetings. Uh, and continue the ongoing work. Back in um, the early 2000s, Responsible Hospitality at Edmonton was an initiative several years ago that brought us brought focus on the nighttime economy and had some really fantastic outcomes. After it was defunded, the work and focus on nighttime economy was lost. So it's really vital that we reinvest in this industry as well as the skill sets needed to support it at the city level and continue to fund it. 
we want this work to continue. And we see the next steps as creating a position and potentially an alliance as a good step forward, um, as long as we have some stakeholders that are actively engaged and will continue to, to support the work going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next, we will go to Lauren Farnell. Sorry, let's try that again. Good yes. afternoon, everyone. Yeah. My name is Lauren Farnell, and it's my pleasure to be here today to speak in support of the Edmonton Sport and Cultural Traction Plan. Currently, I serve as an Associate Vice President of the Grey Cup and Events Department with the Canadian Football League, responsible for overseeing the long-term strategy, growth, and success of Canada's largest annual single-day sporting event and week-long celebration. Additionally, from a sports perspective, I'm an active board member of Sport Edmonton and Do North Events, of which my colleagues are also here today. In other words, I have experienced firsthand the significant importance and value events provide from an economic, social, and reputational benefit perspective. And as someone who works in the business of cultivating memorable experiences, I can tell you that Edmonton has something very special. In my role with the CFL, I've worked closely with the Edmonton Elks, the City, and Explore Edmonton to host some of our most successful events to date. The Grey Cup, the CFL's championship game, is a national experience. The event provides host cities with a powerful national showcase, enhancing community pride and generating millions of dollars of economic impact. We see fans from across North America flock to the host city to experience a week of compelling engagement opportunities and events as varied and colorful as the cities that present them. Similar to other major events, the CFL manages a competitive bid process in order to award the Grey Cup each year. It's worth noting that as opposed to simply transplanting the event into the host community, we seek to engage our local host cities and activate in a way that is reflective of the community flavor, ensuring the uniqueness of the city is captured from year to year and market to market. The last time Edmonton hosted the event was November of 2018, a tremendous success, resulting in an economic impact exceeding $81 million. Over 430,000 people attended events, 30,000 visitors from out of town spent approximately 29 million during their stay, and the game garnered a television audience of 3.3 million. And while not every event can be record-breaking, each has the capacity to grow the local economy, the visibility of the destination, and to build social enhancement for local residents. More recently, we hosted another of our annual events here in Edmonton, our National Combine, the most important platform and showcase for our young CFL prospects. Edmonton played host to 100 national and global athletes over the course of five days in March of 23. As a partner, Edmonton was able to offer a competitive opportunity which included financial and value and kind support, venue partnerships, and localized support from a multitude of vendors. Partners the likes of the City of Edmonton and Explore Edmonton are unicorns in this industry. A one-shop stop model offering continued support every step of the way, which I can tell you makes major events like Grey Cup and Combine so successful. When events come to town, they are seeking the expertise and institutional knowledge that Edmonton has a wealth of experience in. And what Edmonton may lack in other assets will never be the financial, cultural, or political epicenters. It more than makes up for in its servicing of the events and in building demand and excitement, all of which make Edmonton an incredibly appealing host as a right to a rights holder. Prior to my time with the CFL, another impactful opportunity I've had to work, I've, I've been fortunate to work in close collaboration and partnership with these two groups is the FIFA Women's World Cup Under 20 event in 2014 and the Senior Women's event in 2015, of which I managed marketing and communications efforts with the local organizing committee. Edmonton was again able to shine, hosting Canada's opening match to a sellout crowd of 53,000. At the time, a new attendance record. It was the largest crowd to ever watch a national team in any sport in Canada. None of this would have been possible without the incredibly strong Edmonton hosting partnership model. The model here in Edmonton is unique and from both my CFL and FIFA experiences, I can tell you the hosting experience was second to none. That isn't just based on my experience to date, I have heard it from others within the industry. Their experiences hosting major events in Edmonton is unlike anything else because it is so seamless and the support structure so firmly entrenched. Sport tourism is a growing industry. Events are critical to our communities and value and, and the value they provide to deliver to the health and well-being of our citizens. Edmonton continues to raise their hands to be at the forefront of attracting such events, but so do other competing cities. And without the continued recognition for the value these events bring and the importance of funding them appropriately, Edmonton will be at risk of missing out on these opportunities. I encourage this executive committee and Edmonton City Council to continue prioritizing and investing in the attraction of major events to Edmonton before it's potentially too late. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for, for joining us. Next, we will go to uh, Dan Mason, joining us remotely. Hi there. Uh, thanks so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and uh, present today. Uh, I just wanted to say at the outset that I'm a professor of sport management at the University of Alberta and uh, also on the board of Sport Edmonton. And I've come into uh, my board membership rather recently. Um, I think one of the things I've always enjoyed is the ability to be at arm's length from a lot of the things that I study. And so as part of my previous research, I've been to Manchester, I've been to Melbourne, I've spoken to mayors and chief executive officers and city councillors and the, the heads of destination marketing organizations. And what's been said so far about Edmonton's reputation as a host city is all true. Um, they're all very, very uh, interested across the world. They all know about Edmonton and Edmonton's ability to bid for and host events and that kind of thing. So this whole punch above your weight uh, comment really holds true, at least in, in my own experience. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that's important to note here is that um, we need to think about the event hosting strategy uh, in the context of amenities and city amenities. And so some cities have certain kinds of amenities like natural amenities, like mountains and weather and that kind of thing. Uh, and others have to build more of their amenities. And so Edmonton is a city that has a beautiful um, park system, which is great, but doesn't necessarily have the same kinds of amenities as other cities. And so what happens is there's a need to develop amenities that make it an attractive place to live or work or visit. That's sort of triple a human capital element. You want to make it a great place for people who want to come visit and stay, spend their money and leave. People who want to relocate their businesses to and work here and then place things for that are great for, for the local residents to engage in as participants or, or spectators and that kind of thing. So I think that um, one of the things that we have here is we have infrastructure available to host uh, major sporting events. So unlike other cities, hosting major sporting events doesn't require the same kind of infrastructure outlay because it's already in existence here from previous event hosting. Uh, there's also uh, know-how here. Um, there's the ability to uh, engage groups, bring parties together, bring people together, understand how to put these things together the right way and be successful. And we've already heard about some of that uh, being spoken of already today. Um, and I think that one of the things we need to understand is that cities that are successful are also cities that have vibrant night lives and also have event strategies. It's not a sort of a, a zero sum game. And so I think that what we need to, to understand is that a major sporting event strategy is critically important if it's embedded into this broader strategy of events. So you can have different events of sizes and scopes that can reach different parts of the community and some will have a greater tourist um, element to them, but also embedded in this broader civic strategy to make a place, a place a great place to live and to work and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to make that comment and just say that I think that Edmonton has already done a, an amazing job and it's an incremental uh, sort of process here. The, the, the wheels are already in motion, there's momentum. Uh, and certainly when, it, when you look at it from a cost benefit analysis, I think that certainly it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's in the interest of the city to keep putting resources into this to make sure that uh, they continue to host the events that they do. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Dan. Next, we'll go to Lindsay Harrison from Do North Events. Good afternoon, Mayor Sohi and Executive Committee. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon. I appreciate speaking with you. I'm Lindsay Harrison, Chief Development Officer at Do North Events. Do North Events is at the table today as a local not-for-profit organization that partners with the City of Edmonton, Explore Edmonton, the Government of Alberta, Government of Canada, and local and national sport bodies to deliver many of the events attracted to Edmonton. We are best known for de delivering major triathlon in Edmonton since 1998 under our past moniker World Triathlon Series Edmonton. However, through increasing demand over the past two and a half years, we now support other major events in Edmonton, including cycling, 3x3 basketball, volleyball, athletics, and of course, triathlon. We are at a critical point with major event hosting in our city. Whether we maintain the success of 20 plus years of building our major event hosting ecosystem or not. I've experienced firsthand the work it's taken to create this ecosystem enhance our reputation and be at the forefront of international sport hosting, having helped create the first major hosting strategy almost 15 years ago during my time at EEDC, now Explore Edmonton. And it certainly didn't happen overnight. 
It's the careful investment in the sports and events that have proven success in our city, like triathlon, like basketball, like athletics, and the calculated risks needed to inv invest in new opportunities as well. As city administration and Explore Edmonton can attest to, attracted events are well thought out, vetted, and strategic decisions made by event professionals to invest in events that provide a significant return for our community. Economic return, of course, but also sport, social, and reputational returns. Edmonton is known throughout the world as a top tier event host. This has been 20 plus years in the making. If we choose not to fund the sport event strategy, it will take years to get back to where we are today. Edmonton is set up to host. The foundation has been laid. The relationships have been built. Rights holders want to be here, but it won't happen without the city's funding, investment and support. The province has recently committed to continue funding these anchor events, triathlon, basketball, athletics, and has asked to meet about ensuring these continue to be sustainable for years to come. EDMH through Explore Edmonton is also at the table. However, to fulfill and implement the city's strategic event plan, to stay relevant and to continue to impact the community through event hosting, it's critical to have the city's investment as well. I'm sure you're all aware that events delivered in Edmonton take thousands of volunteers, hundreds of workers, hotels, taxis, restaurants, suppliers, numerous other local, small and medium sized businesses. Yes, the sport hosting sector needs investment from government, all levels of government, to attract and deliver high profile events. But few sectors provide the same level of benefit across all three pillars, social, reputational and economic. As a tangible example, the 2027 Multisport World Championships, a 10-day, 4,000 participant, 8,000 visitor World Triathlon event has been awarded to Edmonton. It is part of this SOBA ask and would be leveraged, leveraged to attract an additional 2.5 million in other government funding for the city to result in 15 million of true economic return. Events are what we do in Edmonton. It's part of our identity. Over decades, we have built an entire sector that supports hundreds of Edmonton workers and businesses and attracted many to our city to work, live and play. It's time to return to the longer term strategy and continue to be a leader in sport event hosting. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, next, we'll go to Todd James. James, sorry. No, no, Nolan is not speaking. Todd James. Mayor Nolan did sign in. Oh, okay. Okay, Nod will explore. Okay, it uh, was explore. Okay, all right. Then we'll go to Nolan Thiessen. Thank you for having me today. I'm Nolan Thiessen. I am the uh, newly appointed uh, CEO of Curling Canada. Um, you know, we're one of the national sport organizations that that has uh we're an events-based business so we move around the the country um and you know um we we carry large to small events all over the country um for the sport of curling um you know i think the biggest thing for me that i just wanted to jump on and and be able to support um was Events are are so valuable to sport and um, and and to healthy well being um, for everybody. Um, they just provide a platform for us to be able to showcase um, each of our each of our sports, and the events are best delivered when they have the support of city. Um, tourism bodies and city governmental bodies. I think the biggest thing that, that I wanted to showcase was um, I know that there's um, a plan here from Edmonton Sport um, and being able to have the support of a city body is critical to the success of every single one of the events. Um, you know, our largest event every year is the Briar, um, which, you know, a couple of years ago in Lethbridge produced 17 million of economic impact. And so, you know, we're, we're able to bring major events, um, inspire people, and they're so valuable to the, um, 
to um, to have the city support. So I just wanted to jump on and be able to provide that. Okay. Thanks, Nolan. Uh, next, we'll go to Todd James now. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon, Mayo Sohi and, and executive council members, members of council. Um, I'm here today in my role as chair of Edmonton's BIA council, representing all 13 BIAs in the city and approximately about 5,000 businesses. I would also like to recognize the other uh, BIA EDs that are in the room and, in, and watching online as well, um, as this is an issue of interest within our communities, the uh, Nighttime Economies Report. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge how lovely it is to be here in person today at City Hall uh, and to acknowledge that this space is a site for democratic dialogue, meaningful partnerships, and a legacy of building a better place for Edmontonians. I wanna take this theme through the next few minutes as I, as I speak with you. I joined Edmonton's BIA world in the late in late 2019, which seems like a very long time ago right now, uh, months before the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was during this time that we saw significant pivoting and leadership within our BIA community. We also observed what was happening in local economies throughout North America and what other municipalities, regional governments, provincial and federal governments were doing to support local economies and what resources were being created and supported in other districts. I think framing things around the pandemic are important because our relationships are different. Our partnerships are more meaningful. And, and um, I think it's important to underscore that. While we are concerned by aspects in this report that have maligned the significant work that BIA boards and workers do every day within our city. We view the partnership with the city of Edmonton as a primary partnership. We couldn't do what we do without the city of Edmonton. And at the same time, I think BIAs provide a significant partnership and conduit to the work that the city of Edmonton also needs to do. When we frame the deeply important work that municipal governments do, I would assert that it is the most direct democratic work that citizens and organizations can engage with their elected representatives and leaders. The majority of work done by cities is about the work that most often affects the residents directly. And I believe that there, there are terrific opportunities to pivot and recalibrate the work that the city of Edmonton does within local economies. There's a long legacy in Edmonton boasting, and some of you who may be a bit older would understand the adage of, we are the best city in the best province in the best country to live, work, and shop. I believe that this heritage is not always productive and stymies our economic growth. We often reach for the biggest and the brightest. And while that is aspirational, it is not always practical. While we should have a balance between international and national events and projects, we've heard many speakers today eloquently talk about lasting relationships. It is the time for a refocusing on local economic work as well. There are significant resources allocated to arm's length organizations, at least three, that are focused on exploring, on limiting, and globalizing Edmonton. But in contrast, just a smidgen of actual direct incentives and intentional strategic work on attracting, nurturing, and growing local entrepreneurs and businesses. Businesses, I need to underscore, that are a significant tax base and revenue stream for this city. Edmonton's BIA Council would advocate for a restructuring of the priority and efforts of 
a local economic task force with actual resources and political capital to build a local economy that rewards innovation, diversity, and hard work. We would, deeply, we would be deeply eager to start and build a new, true partnership around economic development from our streets up. Currently, there is not a fulsome plan towards local economic development, and this could grow from the structure, I'm almost done, of the economic action plan with resources and a stronger focus around supporting local economies. Many Canadian and North American cities do this, including Calgary. Why is there not a greater equity between big international projects and attracting the big fish when we can also sustain ourselves with our local businesses, services, and economies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Todd, next we'll go to Brent Oliver. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Sohi, members of the Executive Council and Council. Uh, my name is Brent Oliver, and for the last 30 years, I've worked in the nighttime economy of Edmonton. Uh, since 1993, I've been everything from a musician to a DJ, to a security guard, to a bartender, to a venue owner, to an artist manager, to a sound technician, to a music agent, but most importantly, a patron of events that happen after 5 p.m. I'm primarily known as a local promoter of live music, including the Winter Eruption Music Festival in downtown Edmonton, and former talent buyer for venues like the Starlight Room, Sidetrack Cafe, New City, and more. I currently book entertainment for Cineplex's national properties in Canada, including the rec room locations in Edmonton. This experience coupled with 10 years of policy work in the arts and nighttime economy structures makes me keenly suited to comment on the information presented to you today on recommendations towards improving and solidifying an economy that goes sadly under the radar in Edmonton and other parts of the world. While I'm here to specifically support the information presented today on the nighttime economy strategy, I echo my colleagues in urging to have this information become policy and turn into necessary steps to fill gaps that have been lacking within the Edmonton City Administration. A civic office dedicated to the nighttime economy can have a valuable twofold effect for the city. An internal office can coordinate with other departments to communicate and evaluate for the needs of everything from live music, venues, theaters, sporting events, restaurants, nightclubs, and more. Furthermore, additional programming opportunities like night markets and other outdoor events should have a point of communication for permitting, best practices, and navigating other city departments. The other benefit of a civic nighttime office and a night mayor could be to bring new policies and red tape production to our industry while working with stakeholders like the Government of Alberta and AGLC. Quite simply, there is no downside to a department like this existing within the city. Any taxpayer or budget cost associated with the funding of this department should see a direct return on investment from a boost to our businesses and a building of a more robust nighttime economy with strategy and planning based on the success for the city and the businesses. While we may punch above our weight in hosting international events, we certainly don't when it comes to cultivating our local nighttime economy that is here day in, day out, and long after the large events leave town. Finally, I urge Council to act upon its measures and recommendations that were presented nearly two years ago. Since Council directed administration back in July 2022 to collaborate with Explore Edmonton to develop a nighttime economy strategy and report, we have seen countless nighttime businesses, live venues and events canceled due uh, in part of the lack of a city priority for our industry. The time is now to enact this office and I see the benefits for our industries as an important piece for an economic development in our city. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Brent. Next, we'll go to Brian Christensen, joining remotely. Great, thanks very much. Um, I, I'll turn my camera on here. There we are. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of Executive Committee. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Brian Christensen. I'm an Edmontonian, a musician and theater artist, and I work as an arts, culture, and creative industries consultant at a firm based in Toronto called Nordicity. And through that work, I've been involved in the development of live music strategies for cities and towns in Canada, like Kingston and Halifax. I worked on the creative economy strategy in Calgary. I do municipal arts and cultural planning, and I did my master's research at the intersection of live music venues and property tax policy. 
So it won't surprise you that I'm quite excited that my hometown is jumping into nighttime economy work, and I hope it's a sign of more concrete things to come from this council that will lift up our street level vibrancy. The uh, underlying point I really want to emphasize is I know that public safety is front of mind for everyone in this meeting, and I'm not minimizing its importance. I live downtown. I understand the context. This report lays out how the perception of safety issues is a major deterrent to the kind of vibrancy we all want to see in the core, which is something that we all know. That said, I wish this report did a better job of driving home the deep body of evidence into how cultural programming and in particular live music can, uh, can transform a local economy and support our public safety goals through eyes on the street, people being out and about natural surveillance. I'm not suggesting that live music is the one and only nighttime economy silver bullet or the only essential ingredient here, but I only have five minutes. So it's the ingredient I'm focusing on because it's a really good one. Um, as an example, Austin, Texas is one of the fastest growing economies in America, and there's very clear evidence that live music was the spark that drove that growth. Their live music scene spawned South by Southwest in the 80s, and the city's cultural scene became a destination for young skilled workers and university students. Those workers started companies, Silicon Valley took note and started opening offices there, and the rest is history. It's now a huge tourism destination. It has a burgeoning tech sector, and its violent crime rates have sat below national averages for decades. Uh, we have all the same ingredients right here, and Austin bears out the field of dreams rule. If you build it, they will come. We have a young population. We have a great post-secondary system with renowned music programs, I might add. Um, we have a festival scene that's the envy of the country, which needs support, by the way. And though we obviously have housing challenges to address, we know Canadians are moving here because of our relative affordability. So I really want to encourage this council to think creatively. It's, it's called creative policy for a reason. Uh, look at what Toronto managed to do protecting live music venues through property tax subclassing and historical designations. Look at what Austin was able to do with its Red River Cultural District, giving live music venues more influence over land use planning and street level policies. Other cities in Canada are outpacing us in this space. In just the past few years, I know that cities uh, much smaller than us, uh, Hamilton, Surrey, Kingston, Halifax, have all developed and implemented live music strategies. I would also point to simple things like creating loading zones in front of venues, creating development incentives for setting up new performance spaces. Uh, investigate the utility of a cultural district designation, perhaps downtown or around the, fr around the fringe grounds on White. Uh, install a permanent outdoor stage in the Ice District. Louisville, Kentucky activated a space like that and has live music there nearly every night. These are just a few generic ideas, though. Go ask Starlight Room and the Buckingham and Soho and Double Dragon what they need. Running a music venue is a punishing business, but they're so essential to a vibrant nighttime economy, and we can't risk losing them. In closing, I would just say we were all really excited when Edmonton hosted the Junos last year, and we saw firsthand what our nighttime economy can look like when its performance venues are firing on all cylinders. I don't think we can enforcement our way out of this, but in my view, enhanced cultural programming can be the quickest and most exciting route through our vibrancy challenges. In Edmonton, we've talked before about being the Austin or the Nashville of Canada, so let's actually do it. Let's build on the Juno's momentum and the momentum that will generate this year hosting the Canadian Country Music Awards. I know that the West Anthem Group is working on a music strategy by and for Edmonton that I think is coming later this year. And I really hope the council will consider that strategy as a natural extension of this area of work. Live music development will support public safety. It will drive economic development. It will drive tourism and it will bring substance to the nighttime economy that we all want to build. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Brian. Next, we'll go to Ryan Bird joining remotely. Good afternoon, everybody, and um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and allowing me to speak today. I think everyone's brought up amazing topics, but a couple topics I want to bring up. Someone mentioned Toronto and the Night Auditor. The Night Auditor in Toronto deals with the VPA. That's four major cities, not one major city. Uh, Hamilton. Hamilton, just let you know, has $575 million in profit regarding uh, tourism. I'm not, I am against the night auditor, unless the city changes the policy and um, brings in uh, a position where we're not as taxpayers spending that money. So I've lived in all major cities, Toronto, Boston, my family has offices uh, across Canada. I moved here in 2012, I lived downtown, love downtown. 
And then I had children and it became unsafe for me to live downtown with my children. That's how I felt and those are my feelings. You took away the market downtown, which wrecked the downtown. We've lost the community. Edmonton 2012, 2013 was amazing community. And in the last four to five years, we don't have a community anymore. Uh, I live in the West End and the West End feels, why don't we have events here? South End, why don't we have events there? We are not a community. Until Edmonton decides how we become a community again, and it's not about the downtown or the Strathcona market, it's about Edmonton. And spending money on, on a new department, we have to take that money from a different department and create a new department if you're gonna do that. But taking more money from us is not the way of doing it. I think that the, the sports and the events that we've done are amazing, but look at, if you want to pull up Toronto, and it's mentioned Toronto and Hamilton has been mentioned six or seven times during this meeting, Toronto has events throughout the city. Their taste of Toronto, let's say, is all summer throughout the city. Hamilton is the same way. They close off streets for weekends to bring those communities together. So you do Taste of Edmonton downtown, no mom and pop shops can do that. They can't afford that money. Why don't you do the 112, 118th in the South End? Move it throughout the city. If you want to be a city and a city of events and music events and uh, sporting events, it can't just be in one area. It has to be within the whole city to bring the city in. And when I found out about this meeting, I pulled in 100 families and uh, in my community, that's Jasper, Meadowlark, the Highlands, uh, Patrick's, and we sat and I said, when you go to an event, do you stay downtown? And they're like, no, we do not. As soon as the event's over, they pack up the kids and go home. But in 2012, 2013, and 14, they would stay downtown. But it's not safe for them. They're that they don't want to take the transit. Now, if you're talking about events, didn't this happen last year when a hockey event was happening for the youth and they told them not to take the TT, not to take the transit in Edmonton because it's not safe? Until we make this community safe again and become a community where you can knock on your neighbor's door and say hello. And hey guys, there's an event in this in, in the West End, not just downtown. You're not going to be able to be successful. And I'm sorry to say that. I love Edmonton. Edmonton is my home now. And I think you guys are doing an amazing job, but we have to become a community again. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us, Ryan. Next, we'll go to Katie Ingram. Good afternoon and Eid Mubarak to everybody who's celebrating. I'd like to echo Todd's comments that it's very nice to be back in person in City Hall. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of myself and my experiences in this area, as well as uh, in my capacity as an advocate on behalf of the Edmonton Independent Hospitality Community and Canadian restaurant workers. Um, so one of the things that came out of that in the pandemic, uh, uh, advocating during the pandemic was that uh, a learning for me is that Restaurants are the fourth largest employer in Canada, uh, and that's just restaurants. So um, when we look at, at that, and not even including um, live music venues, um, hospitality, tourism, when we look at that, what an economic driver that is or could be if we harness that in the city, um, I think is a huge, hugely missed opportunity up until this point. Um, and I know that um, when I saw this come up again, I was quite excited. And I'm really hopeful that executive and council adopts this and moves forward and keeps the momentum going because I think that the potential within uh, the nighttime economy strategy is huge. A couple of things that I wanted to um, highlight were <laughs> one of the comments that were in the report. Um, 
with me one second here. So when we get to the part about the government engagement, the quote from a business owner is, it is hard to communicate with the administration about the challenges we face as a business when there isn't someone to talk to who has faced our challenges themselves. Solutions aren't provided to us by the government. We have to figure things out ourselves. That could be any business owner in Edmonton. The amount of times that I have felt that, the amount of times that I've heard that from other business owners is too many to count. So I think that if anything can hit home, it's that there needs to be a, an advocate and a, a place within city administration that business owners can go to, especially in the nighttime economy, and feel heard and feel like action is happening. One thing that I, one example that I want to highlight that's really relevant right now is that Hudson's Pub on White Ave is dealing with a patio concern. And whether or not uh, the decision would be different from whoever is making that decision around whether that patio or not should exist on White Ave, the concern as a business owner for me and the frustration that I know from a lot of other business owners is that the construction on that sidewalk was completed in the fall. The decision on the patio was made on March 1st. That is an absolutely unacceptable time frame for a business to be left without answers and a month to scramble and decide what they're going to do for a major piece of their revenue in the summer on such a vital uh, arterial cultural district in our, in our community. So when I see in the media that that person, that business owner had been advocating or, or touching base monthly and there be no answer for that many months, that really, really hits home that this doesn't seem like a priority for administration. And that the difference that somebody dedicated to the nighttime economy and somebody who recognizes what a huge economic driver the nighttime economy is and will prioritize concerns like that, what a difference that could make. I also want to um, highlight that there is some, when I read through the report, some of the priorities um, that came up, there are, are things that are already being done amongst the hospitality industry that resourced with city backing and city funding could really impact a lot of other city priorities. There are venues and restaurants and hospitality businesses that are equipping all of their staff with harm reduction training. We are dealing with that as a community in Edmonton, a drug poisoning crisis, things happening on our street. We already have all of these people that are ready and resourced and how are we mobilizing that as a community in absence of provincial resources in that regard. Um, so I think that there are, is a huge opportunity to build off of um, things that are already happening in the hospitality community if there is a focus. And so I strongly urge um, this to move forward and to, to become a priority. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. So that concludes the presentations from uh, speakers that were registered to speak. Uh, Mayor uh, David has joined since you called his name. Uh, David Plamonen? Yes. Okay, we'll go to David then. Go, go ahead, please. David, you have five minutes. Thanks so much, uh, Mayor Sohi, and, and to the rest of the council. Um, I likely won't need the entire time, but I appreciate it, and thank you for fitting me in. Um, I just wanted to speak to one specific portion of the, uh, the nighttime engagement strategy, uh, the nighttime economy strategy, excuse me, uh, specifically as both a business owner and an active member of my uh, BIA, the Alberta Avenue Business Improvement Association. Um, one of the concerns that I have, while I agree with some of the notes specifically related to business engagement in the strategy, is the low number of response rates that are being used to promote uh, a lack of engagement or a lack of support being expressed by businesses. Um, my understanding is the actual response numbers are a very, very small percentage of businesses that actually are actively involved in the BIAs. Um, and now I'm worried that this message is being promoted as the BIAs don't feel supported um, through the BIA model and that that is going to be used as a leverage to change the model that is working for a lot of businesses. I obviously can't speak for every business that's part of a 
BIA. I can't even speak for all the businesses that are part of our BIA, but I am a, a member of our BIA uh, executive committee, and I'm very involved in actively trying to explore how we can make Alberta Avenue a more vibrant neighborhood, particularly um, through the nighttime economy work. Um, this past summer, we did a lot of work in developing and delivering a, a night market model that brought in not just different businesses from Alberta Avenue, but from other areas of the city as well. And while there are definitely areas where we can improve, um, we collectively as a business improvement association and as businesses on Alberta Avenue know firsthand what the challenges are of our neighborhood and what the strengths are of our businesses. And so when the recommendation is to uh, create an external uh, uh, support agency through the city of Edmonton, that gives us a lot of concern uh, that this is being done without proper engagement and consultation from the businesses that are going to be impacted by this. We feel at our BIA, and I suspect that this is probably going to be the, the consensus from many other active BIAs, that we know our markets best, we know our industries best, and we know how to engage with our communities the best. And rather than have money being funneled into an, another uh, city-run uh, department or city-run program, we feel that it would be better to utilize funds going directly to the BIA so that we can leverage those funds um, either through grants or through direct support opportunities to continue to develop our own nighttime economy strategies that will be relevant to our areas. Because we know firsthand that Alberta Avenue has a very unique set of challenges, but also a very unique set of opportunities that exist within uh, that framework that aren't going to be appropriate for other BIAs and aren't going to be the same strategy. So we want to make sure that we're avoiding a one-size-fits-all approach that's going to be leveraged across all the different BIAs. So I just wanted to express that as both a business owner and an active member of our BIA, that while I do think there are opportunities for the BIAs to improve, I don't think that removing the BIAs from the conversation or taking a very narrow perspective from specific businesses uh, and applying that to all BIAs is going to be the best way forward to impact our work in developing a nighttime strategy that works for us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. So that concludes the presentations from... Uh, uh, speakers. Now we will open up uh, uh, for council committee members and council members to ask questions. Before we do that, I just want to assure BIAs that the findings of this report do not change, at least my perception about BIAs, and I can speak on behalf of council as well. BIAs have been phenomenal. You have been leading the work and your participation and support for the businesses. Uh, particularly over the last number of years and coming out of COVID and during COVID has been phenomenal. So uh, thank you so much for all the work that BIAs and your leadership has been has been doing. I just want to assure you that whatever the findings are of this report, do not change the views of this council of the, and the importance of BIAs and your engagement and support for businesses. I want you to know that. Okay. With that, I will open up for questions. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much, um, and thanks to all the speakers who who joined us today. And I would echo the mayor's comments around um, just the the importance of BIAs as city building partners, especially when it comes to uh, to nighttime economy and, and vibrancy in our business community. Uh, so I might actually start with um, with David. I really appreciate you raising the example of the night market um, that that was held in the Alberta Avenue BIA. I'm sure there are examples in other BIAs of um, of business leaders taking it upon themselves to to do these types of initiatives. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to, I guess, how that work influenced perceptions of safety and well-being. Like, I, I'm, I'm struggling because this report seems to suggest that um, a sense of safety and security is a prerequisite to, to vibrancy, but I think that the types of activations you describe can actually be a vehicle for enhancing safety and, and well-being in neighborhoods. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I think safety is something that we're very cognizant of at Albert, on Albert Avenue and something that we're constantly discussing at a BIA level. Um, in terms of the night market itself, um, I think that there was a general sense of comfort and safety for uh, a wide uh, and diverse um, demographic of folks to participate. We saw many families coming to the night markets. We saw many young folks, older folks, um, and it was really representative of the strength and diversity of Alberta Avenue. I think one of the advantages of having night markets, markets in, the, in the method that we did was which having uh, which was having them hosted at various businesses um, helped destig 
destigmatize Alberta Avenue as a whole and also help drive more activity to those specific businesses and showcase those businesses. Uh, for us, safety was always a primary concern, and that was done through things like uh, proper planning, uh, communication with both the city uh, and uh, police forces and, and what we were going to be doing, as well as having properly lit areas um, and well-traveled areas for people to, to feel comfortable and safe. Um, but I do think the safety conversation is a bigger one than just a nighttime economy. And I think there is a lot of underlying challenges that we recognize um, in the business side of things that need to be addressed when it comes to creating a more safe and vibrant neighborhood, which includes better funding for mental health, uh, substance use addiction, and, and all of those services that are impacting safety um, on not just Alberta Avenue, but across the province. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and I might jump to speaker uh, Christensen. I really appreciated your presentation and something that really stuck out in my mind is um, how you you spoke about arts and culture and live music in particular uh, as an opportunity to, to really transform perceptions of safety um, by increasing foot traffic, having more folks in these areas. Um, it sounds like you you live and breathe this. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have any anything further you'd like to add on that front um, as yeah, opportunities to use cultural programming uh, to support that in our core. Uh, I, I think, excuse me, I think you, you nailed on the head there. We, and in particular with your, your previous question, um, that we often think about this in, in what I perceive to be a backwards way where uh, instead of trying to bring enforcement and safety, public safety measures to uh, to our, um, you know, our, our core spaces in order to make possible uh, these kinds of cultural programming opportunities. Uh, there's a, a heavy body of evidence from other cities that uh, if you do one, public safety comes uh, comes later. Vibrancy, people being around, people wanting to go out. These are necessary preconditions to public safety, and it's a much simpler, clearer, and more holistic way to go about it, in my view and also a lot more fun. Yeah, I think, thanks so much. Um, and I might jump to um, either Punita or, or Cherie. I uh, really appreciated you being here. And um, I guess I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about some of the work that you are doing in this space. I think that was missed in this report in a really big way. Um, and, and in particular around, I think you both highlighted getting the basics right. Uh, things like, um, like cleanliness, like litter pickups, you're doing a lot of that work yourselves, is that correct? Yeah, it is, thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, in addition to, to what the city does, and this is, I think, even more impactful in, in a district like Old Strathcona where um, they don't have something like the Centre City Optimization Pilot that we've had over the last year, um, the supplemental services that the BIA uh, funds and delivers, I think, is really critical. Um, there was a time, Cherie has told me this, where Every Saturday morning and every Sunday morning, the city flushed all of the sidewalks in Old Strathcona in the morning because that's a necessary thing you have to do every night um, because you have to clean the sidewalks when you have people out all night um, doing whatever they're doing on the sidewalks. Um, and, and those services don't exist anymore from the city. And so BIAs in many cases, if not all of our cases, have filled those gaps. So whether it's us, whether it's Old Strathcona or other BIAs, um, we do a lot of supplemental services and filling gaps that are left behind by the city. Thanks. Thank you, Constance Silver. Councilor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I have a lot of questions, so I might not get through them all. Um, but uh, maybe I'll start with Mr. Jeans. Um, you said that I think you you at the end of your statement you said that there was that we needed more greater equity I'll say between major event attraction and nurturing local businesses and I was hoping you could expand on that or clarify your remarks because I think you're making a good point there. Um, thanks, Councillor Alden. Um, you know, I I think a lot of it is that when we even in the report, they talked about doing an inventory for nighttime economy. And, and we've had this, I've had this conversation with local economy, is that uh, as we're looking at city plan and districts, district plans evolving out, uh, there could be a number of things that could be done simply by the city, you know, whether it's Arts Hub or someone else, to create an inventory where festivals might be able to go. 
like 10 years ago, how many of us would have thought of Borden Park as a great place for festivals to be or, or other places like that? There isn't a great inventory of where concerts could be held, what is the capacity for gathering spaces indoors for 200 plus people. If we were to itemize that within the city, then it actually inspires resources. You know, it, it's interesting because the city of Edmonton, I believe, a number of years ago, took on an asset-based community development approach. So they looked at the assets in a region or the city as a whole and identified where there were gaps, where there were gifts, where people could interact with that. And I think that plan needs to go the same way. The city, in some ways, is a double-headed beast, or probably a lot of heads, probably at least 13, um, where they do different things. And I think what is also, uh, I think, really important is Local economic development is where you generate a tax base. When large companies come in, when attractions come in, they say things like, where are the art galleries? Where are the public spaces? Can my child have uh, you know, um, violin lessons and things like that? We know that for many, many years of attracting other events. So why don't we also do that for our citizens? Why don't we do that same thing to cultivate, you know, part of the uh, bylaw rezoning was about creating small spaces, small pockets for coffee shops and other things in residential areas. There is not really a, a central consolidated movement around how we cultivate nurture and support local businesses and people to make those risks. I mean, developing a local economic development plan, it's the, the most admin thing, thing you can do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that wasn't the answer I was expecting. Um, I, I, so I might need to come back on a second round, but I'm going to ask Ms. McBrien, you said in your, um, uh, in your statements that um, there were recommendations that you felt weren't defensible. And I think that's a hard thing to say, but I'm interested to hear what you felt some of the recommendations that weren't defensible or doable um, in the report were. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Uh, just to clarify, it was more the, the findings. Like, I think the biggest struggle is that it's presented as a strategy, but a lot of it's sort of attempting to pull together our current state is what the, re like the strategy document is actually containing, but it's incomplete. Complete. Like there's a safety section that references our purple flag thing from 2016 and then talks about the Healthy Streets Operations Center um, that was initiated by Edmonton Police, which is not at all relevant to our BIAs or where our nighttime economy is happening. So I just feel like what's in the report um, as a document that could guide us forward isn't even a complete scan of where we are today and therefore that's why I have a lot of concerns about how it could steer us forward. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, and my last question to Mr. Christensen, um, I take your point on marrying two bodies of work. Um, so do you see a risk today in proceeding with some of the work as outlined and how would you suggest we connect the two when that West, West Anthem uh, live music strategy comes back? Um, well, I, I know that uh, at least one or two of the other speakers on this panel, I think, are involved with West Anthem, uh, and I'm, I'm not, so I can't speak to the, the content of the report. But I would just say that um, this area of work is, is iterative. You look at other cities, they are refreshing these kinds of strategies on you know, biannual basis, uh, music strategies every three to five years. Obviously, uh, hopefully this is coming later this year. Um, but I would just, uh, there will probably be recommendations in there that are specific to live music, but just I would encourage council to think about uh, that subject matter area as like intrinsically connected to what we're doing today. Um, and when we, when we have conversations about public safety to consistently try to link in, in our brains that to, to uh, the recommendations that come around live music and around, you know, around, around vibrancy with cultural programming, because it's all, it's all connected. That's, that's just what I would try to, try to encourage. Thank, thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, I'll, I'll start, uh, and I'll start with uh, Benita. I think one of the most effective, or one of the effective things we did when, came, when it comes to downtown vibrancy was the creation of a director position, dedicated position that would coordinate everything, right? And uh, have you seen that work? 
Absolutely. I, I will say if, if council or committee decides to proceed with the creation of a, of a position and alliance, there's a lot that we could learn from that director of downtown Got vibrancy yeah. position. Mm -hmm. I think, but I, I think it was a big deal that, that move when, mm -hmm. when you made that move, he reported or he or she in the, in the beginning, it was, it wasn't Tom, it's now Tom, yeah. um, reported directly to the city manager. And that sent the message across the organization that that downtown was a priority yeah. and that every department was to remove barriers yeah. and make things happen. And and it was transformational. And now that's been moved into UPE, but the, the impression that it left, that level of prioritization has been invaluable. But also, you also resourced that position yes. with the $5 yeah. million dollar a year yeah. grant. Yeah. And I don't think that position would have been nearly as effective without that. So I think it is worth noting that without that grant, this position might be set up to disappoint stakeholders because I do yeah. question and worry what they might actually be able to get done. Yeah, and, and I've been reflecting on this. In hindsight, I wish we had moved forward on the nighttime economy by creating that position instead of commissioning this report. I think we lost year and a half, two years. And I'm, I'm disappointed with that, but I take responsibility as well, because I think we should, uh, in hindsight, should have given that direction. So want to know, maybe I'll start with Brent, because you brought that up as well. What do we need to, first off, maybe, I don't know if catching up is hard sometimes, like, what do we need to do? What do you see the next steps for us to be expediting some of this work and not being here a year from now and being in the same position? Well, I'll, uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm gonna, I'll be completely honest with you. Sometimes we just have to do it and just mm. uh, not wait for every last bit of information to cover off every last box that needs to be checked. <coughs> I think that there are examples already from other cities, and one of the speakers mentioned it, and I would also mention a place like London, Ontario, who hosted the Junos before we did, because they had a dedicated music and economy office. Um, that's specific to music. I'm talking about a more holistic approach to nighttime economy. All the numbers are there. Whatever Explore Edmonton or anybody else is going to bring to you, I don't think is going to change anyone's attitude that this is important, except for one of the speakers who didn't think it was important. Um, but the subject matter experts that are here are all saying just how important this is. And the thing that I hear more than anything from the, the clients I work with in the downtown core are, is twofold. One, safety. Obviously, this is a, it, the houseless issue is, is an enormous issue that I, I don't think just a local government can, can solve. I think it's all three levels of government. But I think that an office like this kind of like um, one of the other speakers was saying is that, you know, putting a little bit of effort in, into a nighttime economy or, or sort of live music or, or events, that sort of attraction of people can sort of clean up other people, if you, if you know what I'm, I'm mm -hmm. saying. There's, there's a, it, it, it becomes a spotlight the more people that you, that you put into an area. That's number one. And number two, and what I was kind of mentioning about uh, specifically the, the second and third part of this of this report is that the nighttime economy is here all the time. They're here 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. Like even some places are open on Christmas. Where uh, a, a sport event, a national event like the Junos, I'm not saying who, but there, are, there were some that were left with a bit of a bad taste in their mouth because the circus comes to town for six days and then leaves. And then all of these businesses are still there waiting for some support, whether it's from the community, whether it's from council or something else. So ultimately my recommendation is just, just do it. Mm -hmm. I, it's, just, just, I, it's been July 4th, 2022 was the first presentation to council. And I remember talking to you about this when you were yeah. running mm -hmm. at about how important this was. So yeah. like we're gonna run into another election pretty soon. So mm. just anyway, yeah. I've said yeah. too much. No, thank you, thank you for that. And uh, so that end of my time. Uh, Councillor Jans. Thank you, <clears throat> and I, I appreciate the candor in the reports, and I don't mean to 
relate again. I, I echo the mayor's feeling. Like one external consultant writes a report. That's their their conclusion. There, um, I realize there's there's certainly some um, uh, offense taken and 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 noted and not shared. But I just wanted to understand better. Like, what was sort of the process here for some of the partners? Like, was this seeing this report? Was this sort of uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll go to um, uh, guest class and like. How, how, how was the engagement of the OSBA through this process? Thanks for the question, Councillor Jans. Um, I think the engagement through the part of the steering committee was good. Um, both one of my staff members and myself were, were participating. I think it was where sort of it seemed like the work ended and then not getting sort of advanced copies of the report um, before it was published publicly. We would have appreciated seeing it and would have brought up that page about BIAs uh, and would have asked to have that maybe corrected. Um, but the engagement throughout the process was excellent. We were at every meeting and when we could participate and felt heard and even helped with the nighttime economy audit as, in terms of locations. Um, so I think that was sort of Pania's point is that it's not that we weren't engaged, it was sort of where it, where it ended when the report was produced. We were not engaged. So maybe some sort of a, for future, initiative, some sort of a closing the loop, testing assumptions with, with the group would, would have mitigated some of the, the feelings today. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I think anytime uh, we've been on steering committees or advisory committees for different projects at the city, I'm on the Old Strathcona Public Realm uh, advisory committee, we usually get advance notice of, of reports or findings. Um, so that would have been appreciated. Could I, with, with guest Oliver, if I can test, um, I was talking to somebody about this initiative and they were saying like, Michael, the, the pandemic's not over. You think it is, but it's not. And stop like thinking about, you know, getting getting back to the pre-2015s. We're not there yet. We're still, we still have not recovered. I, I just wanted to test that with you, what you're seeing or thinking. That's absolutely true. Um, we have not returned to pre-pandemic levels. There are other markets in Canada that are getting closer but I think one of the big things that has happened is that there's been a habit change to a lot of people who were going out for events um, because for nearly two years they weren't and their events and their, their entertainment was basically a screen at home. Um, to change those habits back takes some time and it takes some effort. And I think that um, there's another thing that we were talking about before this meeting that is you know, the, the, the event industry and a lot of the nighttime economy is so tied to alcohol sales. And right now there are more um, people who don't drink uh, than ever before. And so that that is a, a fundamental shift that has happened in the model. Uh, that, sh that would be something that would be perfect that can be addressed. Um, but the bounce back from, uh, from pre-pandemic, it's the, me the metrics say that it's not close to back. It's maybe 60, 70 percent back. And then venues are still dealing with the higher interest rates, the wage, wage I mean, ven venues, uh, I, can, I can say on a, on a Cineplex level, I mean, Cineplex, because we're a gigantic venue when you, we showed so many movies on, on top of, you know, live events and stuff is that we, we had to take out a, you know, a corporate loan that we're still paying off and plan to pay off for five years just to keep the ship afloat when nobody's coming to, when your entire business model is people coming into a door and, and it doesn't happen, you end up falling pretty far behind. Yeah, um, and maybe uh, guest Ingram, I was, uh, I t some of the other guests shared this sort of the fundamentals, getting the fundamentals right, safety, cleanliness, security, and, and it, it's not lost on me. You've advocated a lot around how one person a day in Edmonton is dying out on the street from drug poisoning. Um, just wanted to test with you some of these other safety and well-being mm -hmm. factors mm -hmm. that I've heard you speak about before, but what were your thoughts here? Yeah, I think that um, what I know that's happening in the hospitality industry and in the restaurant industry um, is that a lot of ownership and a lot of workers out of necessity have taken it upon themselves to learn harm reduction strategies for their businesses and for themselves. Um, and they're working, working on that. And I think that there's more that can be, uh, I think there's more that the city can be doing to leverage that to their own goals as well. Um, because I know, you know, where the city um, basically is coming under criticism is things that are 
um, maybe out of their control, but if you have these resources in terms of workers and industry that are already trained in these areas, how are you leveraging that? And through a nighttime economy strategy that values the people that own these businesses and work in these businesses, they're more apt to buy into the city's, um, the city's overall priorities and come, come to the table with solutions for that as well. Yeah. A couple of well-being things that I want to note that are already happening is that the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton created a specific bystander intervention training program for Edmonton um, nightclubs and mm -hmm. restaurants and hospitality groups that was delivered through 2018-2019 um, and is ongoing. Um, so we have a whole group of, of workers and staff and security um, that are being trained on how to intervene in sexual violence. And again, how are we leveraging that as a city? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Constantine. Uh, Constant, right. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot I was on committee. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, Katie, that bystander training, is that um, sort of for all restaurant workers? I'm sorry, I missed the last half of that question. Is, is that mandatory for all restaurant workers or th is this something that... Um, no, it's not. And it should be. And it should be something that's... Um, reinvigorated or redone every year and that's something when I read through the report that the um, alliance the industry alliance that was proposed I think that 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 can be um, maybe a requirement of membership that there are certain things that that um, uh, businesses that are part of that alliance that they have to agree to certain um, uh, pieces like that, the harm reduction strategy, uh, sexual violence strategy, things like that. Um, it, is, it was a partnership between uh, the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton and AGLC. So AGLC recognized that that was something that was um, happening in a lot of their licensed venues and something that needed to be addressed. Because yeah, like like food safe handling and stuff like that, that's that's mandatory, right? Yeah. So this could be yes. something that could be layered onto that. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And then, and you, and you talked about, you know, restaurants being a large part of the, of the um, nighttime economy and that. Does Restaurants Canada, or who is it, Canada Restaurants Association, do they do any advocacy work or, or provide any support to restaurants? Um, so they, they do. Um, the, the thing about Restaurants Canada and a lot of restaurant um, lobby groups or, or um, advocacy groups is that they are a paid membership. And so especially when we look at local small businesses that are struggling, we're hemorrhaging them on a daily basis, they're not thinking about how they can come up with a monthly fee that they're going to pay to have someone advocate to them, to government. And Restaurants Canada uh, a lot of times has um, large corporations um, interests at heart okay. and that doesn't necessarily represent the smaller local economy, the fabric of the cities, um, what their priorities are. Okay. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, and then I'm just also wondering, following up on, on Councillor Jans's sort of questioning about that, you know, we're not back to the, the pandemic's not over or, or the, I guess, what we've experienced because of it's not over. If, I'm just wondering, people are concerned about affordability. They don't necessarily have the disposable income that they once had. So I, I'm just wondering how much we can encourage people, you know, to, to come back and enjoy the nightlife of our city um, if they don't have the means to do it. I'm, I'm assuming that's still a question for me. Um, um, if you want, yes, please, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think that supporting local, um, has to be a policy choice and not just a consumer choice. Um, and I feel that deeply at all levels. I feel like there has to be specific choices made, not just specific to the nighttime economy strategy, not just at the municipal level, um, but ways to make life more affordable that will in turn, um, invigorate our nighttime economy strategy, like you said, by putting more dollars back into the hands of our consumers. And this strategy excites me about that because having a full-time dedicated person that's going to be advocating not just municipally, but to all levels of government, what the nighttime economy strategy in Edmonton needs to be successful is I think 
going to be a huge determinant of its success. Okay, so so you, you think the timing is good for this? I'm, I'm just, I guess that's what sort of my concern is, is yes. if we're trying to encourage people that don't have the means yes. to go out. Yes, I do. And to echo, to echo Brent, you know, this is a, something that came up in July of 2022, and we're now here in April of 2024. So the best time to do this was July 2022, and the next best time is April 2024. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'd like to frame this, uh, my, my questions around the concept that the first and most basic underlying purpose of a city is to be an economic engine. That's it. And what we want to do is build capacity and mechanisms to generate and create more wealth. And with that wealth, then we can do all the things that we want to do. So with that in mind, I guess my first question would be, um, and this, uh, this is an odd one, I guess maybe I'll go to uh, Katie. So you may not be aware, but Councillor Jans and I have already been in touch with administration on the patio issue. Um, so just to give a, a public uh, record or statement on that, there are a couple different priorities that the city has. One is uh, for pedestrians and throughways mm -hmm. and things like that. The other is the stated idea that we want to grow patio culture and have this like vibrant uh, summer and winter uh, life out in the streets. In your perception, which one should take precedence in commercial areas? <laughs> that's, that's actually a great question and a great point. And I think my... Um, my concern around that area is not necessarily with the decision because I think, I, you know, just on optics for me, the decision is probably the right one. Um, but it's the amount of time it took to make that decision. So had in the fall that business owner been connected with other levels at the city, like the Accessibility Advisory Committee, that could talk them through. These are, these are our concerns in terms of um, pedestrian walkways, people using... Um, um, so the the lack of clarity and communication. The lack of clarity and communication. So okay. it's not necessarily that it's the wrong decision, but how is that business owner being informed in a timely fashion to be able to make huge, um, huge changes that are, are going to greatly impact their revenue? I was on White Ave yesterday. Hudson still doesn't have their patio. It's patio season today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I want to move on. Uh, I've kind of... So there's a reason we cross-referenced all of these things. Visitor economy, nighttime economy, sports and activity, things like that, big events. Um, and these are all separate things, but the goal is to try to bring them all together. But when I look at our uh, city and all of our BIAs and the downtown, we've got one major downtown, but then we've got lots of little downtowns. And that poses a challenge. And so I'm just wondering, how do we tie that all together so that that I mean, there are opportunities, in my opinion. I think there's great opportunities, and there's great opportunities for areas to differentiate themselves. So they all offer something really unique, and it's exciting, and people want to try everything. But how do we bring that concept together so that people look at it and be like, there's so much to do in Edmonton. Look at all these different things I can do. And it doesn't dis detract from anyone's efforts. In fact, it brings it all together. So I don't know who wants to pick that up. Maybe I know that Panita's given a lot of thought to that, so maybe we'll go there first. Yeah, I'll start and then I'll, I'll see if Tom yeah, yeah, wants and then pass to it pick on. it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Councillor. It's something we talk about all the time. Um, and, and we often talk about it in the context of what the city's role in that is. Um, because we don't, and, and Todd spoke about this and I, I touched on it, we don't have real local economic development work happening in Edmonton right now. And I, and I hate to say that because I, I work really closely with my colleagues in, in that department at the city, but it's not the same thing as when it's, you know, all the great work that Explore Edmonton does to promote Edmonton to the world, nobody is promoting Edmonton to Edmontonians. We are, we are the ones promoting Edmonton to Edmontonians. And, and it was really cool to see when it, and Explore did have the opportunity to pivot during COVID because nobody could come here and they were promoting Edmonton to Edmontonians. I feel like we gained some great ground, but when they had to return to their core mandate, it again left that gap. And that's, again, that's actually kind of one of my hesitations with this work is that we're not even doing this for the economy as a whole. There's some key actions in here around 
uh, commer e um, commerce tracking, how much pe are people spending in the nighttime economy, footfall tracking. We're not even doing that, period, let alone for the nighttime economy. So it would be great to have this work happening because then we could do it round the clock, but I think there's some really big gaps in our local economy work that you're probably identifying. Yeah, and I don't know who's gonna go next, but I will also mention, because it has been raised, I think that safety and cleanliness are table stakes. Like that is just the bare minimum that a city should be providing. So anyway, go on. Absolutely, I, I, you know, there's a lot of things in the report, and if you look at the amendments, there are things that the city is slowly working on. And we understand your, the amount of work you want to do and need to do is large and it's wide. So that's why partnerships are really important. Um, I, I would also echo uh, what Panita said. And if we look at BIAs or instead of calling them downtowns, we'll call them main streets. Mm -hmm. And we'll call, um, if we look at main streets throughout North America or even in Europe, uniqueness and character is part of it. And we've learned that from COVID and other things that when shopping local, like Ms. Ingram talked about, is so important, it's because every individual who has a little bit of money can be a curator and decide who they will support, what businesses are important in your areas. And change is always going to happen. What we're asking for is a little bit more consolidation and coordination around all of those efforts. And I think about the investment from, um, you know, the downtown vibrancy, I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm supportive, but jealous. Um, you know, or if we look at the great work that city operations has done, BIAs did not have a specialist in city operations for a long time. And when James Robinson was hired, it caused great ripple effects. We saw things happening. So Thanks. why don't we have that small amount of investment in that same area. I think Amarjeet is, I mean, Mayor Sohi is about to give a, a signal that he said we're uh, not allowed to give at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, so I'm very cautious about I that. I am, I am. <laughs> and I'm trying to signal that to everyone, right? So what? <laughs> okay, uh, Councilor Cardamel. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, um, I want to circle back to the uh, the, the event attraction report for a moment and uh, just a few questions for uh, Ms. Harrison, if I could. Um, and I guess, you know, so uh, are you there, Lindsay? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't see just all who is there. I, you know, we're hearing a lot about, uh, I guess, sort of lasting legacy and, and, you know, where we get the best bang for our buck and, and, you know, what kind of things we support. I don't, I don't view these, conversations as mutually exclusive and I, I feel like I'm hearing a bit of an undertone of that but can you can you speak to what some of the legacies have been first of all maybe with triathlon and I'm, I'm thinking of um, you know the business community that supports those events and and you know has a has a cottage industry so to speak developed that supports those events and then perhaps you know uptake uh, of sport and recreation and and um, you know personal health and body knowledge that, that comes out of these events, uh, you know, with youth and the like. Can you comment on that? Yes, thank you very much. Um, in a way, we're a Do North Events is almost a byproduct of that legacy as a not-for-profit that started just in triathlon and saw that there was demand um, to work with other sporting events in the city and not as a producer promoter. We are, as I mentioned, a not-for-profit, so just do North, in a way, is an example of that legacy where we've grown and been able to work with other sports and develop more legacies in turn and give back to the community. Um, specifically tr for triathlon, because it's been, we have been one of the longest standing local organizing committees in the city. Um, a lot of those things, so we're giving back to Triathlon Al Alberta, who are always pressed, um, the s local sport associations. Alberta and even the National Sport, Sport Associations, they receive, so any revenue um, from those major events go back to those sport bodies as well. So because they're always feeling the pinch so that they can um, develop the sport and grow their membership. So that's one way. Another way in the past has been equipment. So any equipment that we've been able to um, receive 
and get because of hosting major events that always there's always the stipulation that that equipment and infrastructure goes back to the community so we've actually had other triathlons and cycling events and um, running races borrow our gantries borrow some of our equipment um, that we've been able to accumulate over the years. Um, and then, of course, there's also kind of those softer um, legacies in terms of capacity building. So we have our kind of little black book of volunteers um, where there's about 400 in our, in, in our database that we, um, that love, that ask us, and they want to be a part of the events, whether we've even moved away from triathlon, they follow us to three-on-three -three basketball and to cycling and to volleyball. So that capacity building through our volunteers, um, through the summer students that we've worked with over the years, that some have become staff. Um, so those are just some of the ways in which kind of triathlon and due north have provided those, those legacies in addition to the economic return, of course. Yeah, yeah, we talk about the economic return and I, you know, I, I will have to tease out a little bit uh, with others the, I believe somebody said something about, you know, the big circus comes to town and then leaves again and, and that there, you know, there's not a lot of benefit in that. And I guess I'm, I, I'm curious about that. You know, can you speak though, have there been groups in the city that have been able to export their expertise, you know, and, and benefit from that, that they've, you know, learned and developed and, and excelled and prospered here and have been able to export that knowledge to other places? Yeah, absolutely. And just on that comment, I think to your point, like even our suppliers, our local businesses that we worked with, they're all local. We are a local organization. Our businesses that we work with are local unless we can't for some reason. But um, again, that kind of that inventory of suppliers that we've worked with over the years that rely on us and count on us. And as I mentioned, I feel almost that Due North is a bit of that legacy. And, and to your point, right now, our CEO is in Singapore helping to deliver um, the PTO T100 event, which they did move away from Edmonton. It was held here very successfully and is now in other cities, but have realized they just can't seem to do it the way that Edmonton delivered it. And so have asked our... Um, our group to go help do that as well. So we are building capacity. Our priority is local, but um, we have to sometimes build capacity in other regions as well. Yeah. Thank you, that's my yeah. time. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna take break here now for 15 minutes and we'll be back at 3.45. There are other uh, further questions to, uh, to the panel, so please stay if you can. Yeah, okay, we'll be back at 3.45.
uh, call of Consul Kali, Consul Salvador. Good afternoon. Consul Hamilton. Hello. Consul Jans. Good afternoon. Consul Wright. Good afternoon. And other Consul colleagues joining us in the chamber, Consul Stevenson. Good afternoon. Consul Paquette. Good afternoon. Consul Tang. <coughs> Hello. And I will go through the list of colleagues joining us virtually. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Rice. Hello. Councillor Principe. Hello. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. All right. Okay, we were still on questions to the uh, presenters. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I just have one, one primary question left and I might direct it uh, to, to Katie. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening in um, in the hospital hospitality community that are really being led by by the industry, and I'm trying to think about the balance between doing new things versus l sort of leveraging the existing work that is happening and sort of amplifying the good things that that are happening um, within the community already. So, I guess thoughts on that. Like, I I appreciate. Um, the need for a full-time dedicated person for that work, and that is obviously something new, but I guess opportunities to um, to piggyback on the good work that's happening and, mm -hmm. and sort of uh, focusing our efforts there. Yeah, I think that a lot of the things that are happening uh, within uh, the industry are happening out of necessity and just a really ingenious, creative group of workers and business owners. Um, and I think that, um, they're largely a group of people that feel like the city doesn't value their contribution, doesn't support them, um, it throws up more roadblocks than they do help. And so I think if there was a way to bridge that um, and show a real dedicated um, support for the nighttime economy from uh, council and resource it, um, appropriately, I think you could really build off some of the things that are, are already happening and make them that much better. And I think it's just the empowerment of people seeing their business, their industry recognized and valued. Gotcha. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. My apologies. Councillor Nack is also joining us. Uh, okay. Councillor Stevenson, you haven't had first round, right? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've really appreciated the conversation and just uh, wanted to, to touch on one last point, uh, but appreciate all the insights that were shared. Maybe just as Speaker McBrien wanted to ask, you know, I think, I think we're looking at, um, you know, some of the existing programs uh, that can, that are in existence but can be strengthened to, to turn more towards the nighttime economy. Just wondering if you feel that that is also possible. So, you know, vibrancy fund, uh, things like that. Wondering if you see there's also an opportunity there with EAC, for example, how the Edmonton Arts Council can support and happy to hear from, from both of you if you've got reflections on that. Yeah, thank you for the question, Councillor. I, I do think that um, in many ways EAC should be viewed as an economic development agency. And so when we talk about, which we often do, our really disjointed economic development landscape or ecosystem, whatever you want to call it, um, that is a critical piece. And I think we were just chatting here during the break. Um, so much of what we're talking about when we're talking about the nighttime economy is actually about the creative economy. Um, and then so who owns that? And, and it could be an entity like EAC uh, if EAC's mandate was shifted to be more economy focused. Well, and you know, and I would argue, you know, the art of living, I think, speaks about sustainable livelihood for, for artists, and that's, that's an economic mandate, right? So, yeah. And the venues that host them are part of that, and the, like, the festivals that employ, like, it, it's all one big system. Yeah, and sorry, and I guess that's the art of living rather than their specific mandate, but as owners of that strategy. Okay, well, great. I just want to touch on that, and I'll, I'll have some follow-up with our administration on a number of the points that you've raised, but appreciate you all being here. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson, just want to uh, um, have additional few questions. Uh, next steps. 
Recommendation A talks about uh, allocating the resources to create a nighttime economy lead. Maybe I'll just, maybe to just do a Vanita and, and Shuri, or, you know, Brent, or anyone else that uh, wants to respond. Uh, so that's one, and also allocating one time funding of $50,000 to uh, Nighttime Economy Alliance. So if we were to have conversation with the administration when we go to administration, to kind of expedite that, get that going right away, and instead of waiting, right? What do you think? The BIA, or sorry, BIA, the Nighttime Economy Alliance first, or the uh, Nighttime I, I think I think Nighttime Economy lead. Right, right? and the Alliance. And the, and the Alliance, so it's two things, right? right? So if we move forward on both of them, or find ways to move forward right away on those two action items. I guess she's letting me speak. <laughs> um, I think from, from my board's perspective, they do want to see that move forward. Yeah. Um, they remember Responsible Hospitality Edmonton, and as I spoke, that not having those resources at the city really means there's a lack of focus. Uh, but I think it is really impo important to Panita's point earlier that that position needs to be empowered to make decisions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, needs of course. To be high, yeah. But high they can coordinate, they can, you know, uh, support the existing work that uh, that Katie was talking about and build on that work. Uh, so I want to get your thoughts on that, Brent. Uh, you know, what what is the, what is the actionable things we can do now instead of, you know, further I think, away? I think that the actionable thing now is kind of what I said before. Thank you for the question, Mr. Mayor. Um, is just do it is okay. is I think that even before a committee and we were just speaking about this as well is that to have somebody in place within a city department or to creating a city, a city department that committee those those connections those spider webs will start to develop yeah. um, I, I think that as long as the mandate is clear and I believe that with all this documentation the mandate is relatively clear for the importance of this and it's just putting the hammer down and doing it Got it. Okay. That's I just need to know. Uh, and we will be asking questions to administration on how we can operationalize that as quickly as possible. Uh, with that, I'll go to Councilor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, if, uh, if the, let me put it this way, I'm going to go to uh, Brian. You talked about, you gave examples of different municipalities uh, who are already doing this. And I'm not sure if you're, uh, you may, this may be an unfair question, but are you uh, familiar with the structure uh, of how they've set these things up in those various cities? And um, because I'm just curious if there is a, a uh, organizational model that works best. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Councillor. Um, I mean, I think to echo uh, to echo Brent um, and others. I, I think employing somebody like. Uh, like a nighttime economy lead in other cities uh, in the work that I do, music officers are quite common in places like Hamilton, Ottawa, London, Ontario, Surrey. Uh, I think that's a really uh, perhaps the most powerful thing you can do to get the ball rolling. Um, I think the thing that we need most is coordination. You look at Calgary and right now they're developing a creative economy strategy, a nighttime economy strategy. They already have developed specific creative sector strategies, and all of these align on the idea of leveraging the arts to build street level vibrancy. It's built into their tourism strategy. It's built into their development of the culture and cultural and entertainment district. That alignment's a huge asset. Um, I, I, I can speak to a few like tangible things uh, that that other cities are doing, if if that would be helpful. Uh, that would be maybe we'll take that conversation offline because that would be really helpful. And I guess yeah, sure. the broader question, and I don't know who wants to answer this, but that is um, uh, if an office were to be created, uh, who should be in charge of that office? Where should it be situated? What would work best to ensure coordination among all of the disparate and various groups that we've got? Um, uh, thanks, Councillor Paquette. I, I, I think if we were to compare apples to apples in what the city has been doing to date or in the past, whether it's Winter City or Downtown Vibrancy or other things. I think at this point it should be situated within the city manager's office uh, because I think 
um, if the mandate is clear and the direction is there and the resources are there, then other departments will partner with that initiative. So neutral ground, so to speak, but also being able to marshal the resources of the city? Is that sort of the idea? Yes. I mean, I don't like the idea of hierarchy any more than, say, probably the 12 council members do, but I, I think it works, and I think we've seen that work in various okay. aspects today. And this, does it seem to be a consens consensus among folks who are uh, passionate about this? Um, maybe I, I, I can't do a straw poll, but I'm, I'm looking for, for micro expressions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll I'll take a couple questions. Thank you for uh, for your comments on this, Councillor. It's um, I've seen it in other cities uh, where it lives in economic development. I don't believe I th I think that Edmonton is a specific example where I don't think that would work. I think that it needs to be something that not only encompasses economic development, but all the things that we have talked about today, like safety, about advocacy. Um, and also dealing not only on an economic development side of things, but also an advocacy side to, to the province, to AGLC, to permitting, to building, all, all the rest of these things. It, it's, it's such a um, specific yet not really specific. I mean, everybody knows about sort of going out to a restaurant at night or going to a show or whatever. Sure. So, so I, I, I tend to agree with, with Todd that, uh, that the city manager's office and somewhat... Um, somewhat on an island, I think, is, is the way to do it. Okay, great. Um, and I'll, I'll just, if anyone wants an opportunity to weigh in, this would be the time. No? Okay, good. Great. That's great. That's good clarity. And um, I guess the last question is, um, I think I already know what the answer is, but I think we should get this on the record. Any investment we make into this, People will say, well, why are you putting those dollars? One of our speakers even said, don't throw my money at this because all the other things aren't taken care of yet. But we understand that it all has to be a revolving process. But the money that we put in, are we going to have champions out there who are saying, we agree with the city because the investment is going to return to us like at least six to one? Are we going to hear that from folks? Like some kind of actual I, I championing th I of, think this, yes. of this? I, I think yes. I think part of it, though, is that there has to be clarity based on it. I think we need to do some repairing of the relationships that we have with some of our partners. Um, and I think uh, rallying around one call would be a really great way. And, you know, to Councillor Wright's point earlier, um, it's not just about people who have the money to go out and spend in a restaurant or go out. It, it's about the culture entirety. I mean, and we need to, BIAs are about creating accessible, vibrant main streets for everyone. And as we know in 2024, that causes friction. But I think, I believe in our city, I believe in our citizens, and we can build a better main street together. Good, thank you. Uh, so that concludes all the questions to panelists. Uh, with that, you can please step back and you can stay as long as you want to uh, listen to the follow-up uh, discussion from council with the, with the administration. Okay, now we open questions to administration. Okay, thank you so much for join, joining us back. And uh, uh, maybe I'll start 
I'm usually a pretty patient person and uh, like to follow the process. But in this case, I think we lost some momentum uh, and we need to catch up, right? So maybe this question is to finance. Um, recommendation A talks about allocating $200,000 to create the nighttime, nighttime economy lead that's ongoing and then $50,000 for one-time funding for Nighttime Economy Alliance. I would like to figure out a way to do that as quickly as possible, because I had a motion ready to go for further discussion in the fall SOBA, but that's another six-month delay, right? So we want to get a sense, what can, what do, can I amend the, uh, the budget uh, when we set the mill rate in uh, on Octo uh, on April twenty third, like what would be the best process? Yeah, I think because of the timing of this report um, and the spring supplemental operating budget adjustment, which is getting released tomorrow, um, what you would do is in the budget discussion on April twenty third, if you wish to fund this item, you would make an amendment in the budget to do so. Okay, so I want to give my indication that I will, and obviously talk to colleagues on this too, and maybe this will be an opportunity to give <coughs> that signal from colleagues to administration as well, but I'm giving you a signal that I will be bringing forward an amendment to adjust the budget to set up the, uh, 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 the nighttime economy lead. Uh, I don't wait how that look like, administration can figure that out, and also one-time funding of 50 thousand uh, dollars in uh, for the uh, nighttime economy alliance uh, okay so just want to be on the record that I will be doing that uh, it's anyone here from like uh, I want to ask a question about the the success of the anti-racism office being located in city managers office and doing that corporate wide coordination but also citywide coordination on their work so that kind of approach, maybe I'll, at least, or maybe I'll come to you, right? Uh, if we are able to secure this funding, what do you think is the best way to operationalize that funding and, uh, and, and uh, you know, get going on it? Right? I can't comment too much on the, the model that was used with anti-racism, but I can comment on what we've seen with downtown vibrancy. Okay. Um, because we've seen um, the individual both located in the city manager's office, in the deputy city manager's office, and in now in a branch. The value of having a person who has a role, which is crystal clear in terms of what their mandate is, and able to understand where the operations happen in the organization is absolutely critical to be able to get things unstuck. And so it's almost like the this person acts like an internal advocate to get work done. Now, it's not straight line work. It's c very complicated, but I've seen some things happen um, perhaps quicker having someone in this space. Um, so having someone, as Panita had talked earlier, having um, a position start in a city manager's office or in the city manager's office or in a deputy city manager's office does send a signal. So it's a, a question of how strong do you want that signal to be, but when it comes to action and implementation, I see it working effectively in both places. So the signal is important for, um, you know, depending where you put it. However, when it comes to action, I've seen it be effective in both places. Got it, but that's a decision if council amends that mo uh, at the budget but that's a decision that city, uh, in this case, acting city manager will make in consultation with the uh, ELT and other officials within the city. Correct. Oh, got it. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so that is uh, on the on the nighttime economy. I have two questions on the uh, other reports. Well, I'll wait till uh, 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 once other colleagues have gone through questions. Uh, so I'll go to Council Wright next. Thank you very much. So um, I'm just wondering. If it was determined city manager office that it would fall under, um, there, there's been a position open in the city manager's office for the chief climate officer. And I'm just wondering, is can funding sort of be drawn from that that hasn't been used for the past two years or past year and a half? 
cancer rate. I'm not certain about that. Um, it's something we can look at uh, to have some inf additional information when the discussion at Spring Soba. Okay, just so that there's no implication for, for tax levy funding is my concern. Um, and then I'm just wondering about, so the, the BIAs have indicated that um, they weren't properly consulted. And I, I'm just wondering, um, like, what about like post-secondary um, school? Was there any outreach to them? I, I To me, I think they would use uh, a lot of the nighttime economy. Hi, Councillor Wright. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, we did work with uh, post-secondaries at U of A, uh, Grant McEwen. Okay. We engaged with Nate um, through both surveys, workshops, and um, focus groups. So they were part and did inform part of the work that was uh, put into the strategy. Okay, great. I just wanted to check on that. Um, and then um, in your jurisdictional scan, um, what's, I didn't notice anything as far as financial commitments from the different municipalities themselves. Was any of that analysis done? Uh, the only one that we had that information for was the city of Ottawa. Um, and they had, oh, I'm spacing on the number right now. If, if you give me a moment, I can find that. Um, I, but I believe it was 150,000. Uh, for the position, but they were not looking to implement a um, uh, industry working group like we are with the Nighttime Economy Alliance. Okay, um, and is so it just wasn't readily available for the other municipalities that were listed on that scan, or uh, or they they didn't contribute. I would say it wasn't readily available. And for Ottawa, it was a salary of 112000 and a budget of 160000 112000 160000 okay. Okay, that satisfies my curiosity. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton? Oh, just one more. Oh, sorry. Uh, just a point of privilege, yeah. if I may. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think we heard that uh, there was a comment that BIAs weren't consulted, and I don't believe that that was a statement that BIAs made today. Yeah, BI, BIAs were, they made it clear that they were consulted, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Um, I did have questions on the, the sport report, um, but uh, maybe if we're keeping to sort of one round on night nighttime economy, and I don't know, is that your preference? Okay. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll stick to the nighttime economy for now, but I might bleed into the sport report. Um, the speakers today spoke to some, I'm going to say, short-term re remediations. Um, and I was wondering to what extent you thought those were actionable. Um, something I'm conscious of in the course of this discussion is we can talk about the long-term stuff, but um, some quote-unquote quick wins, I think, are, are in order and would serve um, a lot of ends really well. So when we looked at the actions that came forward under the strategy, there's a lot of work that's already being done. So those short wins, um, some of them might be able to be completed in our existing work. Um, where there are areas that um, would be new or in addition to things already underway, this is where we'd look to the Nighttime Economy Alliance mm -hmm. to look at those things to move quickly on, again, with a focus towards action. Um, so, but, but there is an opportunity perhaps to do some of those things in our existing work under our current structure. So to push on that a little bit, like what, what are some of the things that you heard today or you think are already underway that you think, I, and I'm thinking in fairly short timelines, like before the end of 2024, what are some of the, the sort of quick wins that we might see um, delivered? One of the things we're currently working on is our entertainment district. Okay. So something yeah. that's going to directly support our nighttime economy um, in terms of changing a bylaw isn't uh, a lot of um, capital up front to do. Mm -hmm. um, long term, uh, there's likely going to be capital involved, but that's that's a really, really great example of something we're really excited about. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think I just saw the public engagement for that went out. So that's an that's a interesting one to look up if, if people aren't familiar with it. Um, some of the stuff we heard was about, I'm going to say, infrastructure deficits, light bulbs being out. Um, and I think there's been an ongoing sort of, I'm going to call it a white glove walk, where a team of people from uh, the community, uh, stakeholders as well as uh, um, uh, folks from the city walk around and just point out things like foot by foot or meter by meter, I should say. Um, and 
And so I'm wondering, I think one of the recommendations is sort of more of that. I know that's labor intensive, but um, do you see that as something that could help sort of remediate some of these, um, I don't want to call them complaints, but concerns about, about infrastructure deficits in our, our, our main streets? For, I, um, I do believe so. Yeah. We have, um, we do safety walks in yeah. that sort of spirit that does that exact same thing. Mm -hmm. um, James, I don't know if you want to comment specifically on the infrastructure pieces. Yes, we do a lot of walkabouts in advance of major events happening in downtown and in all our BIAs. One of the key things in parallel is the city center optimization initiative that the CPSC committee voted on a Monday. And that's essentially the proactive approach that would serve you know, BIAs across the city well, so both in terms of the daytime and nighttime economy. And that's proactive services that identify the things that were raised at the meeting. So burnt out street lights, uh, damaged sidewalks, uh, clean cleaning issues. So, you know, this is something that's happening in parallel that could potentially bolster the daytime and nighttime economy. So I think that's the item to watch as well. So thank you for that. Um, I think maybe one of my last questions on this is that we heard from speakers today, uh, I think some really good points that there's a variety of sectors um, that, that we could dig into to support the nighttime economy, as well as different parts of the city that want to take part in the nighttime economy. But you know where I'm going with this. This could, we could spread ourselves too thin and not see uh, a much of a return on anything. So um, I think we could eventually get there, but I'm wondering how you or a future nighttime economy lead would prioritize um, some of that feedback from the community with the unfortunately realistic limitations of budget. So I think this is why the Nighttime Economy Alliance is so important to help us with that activity. But some of the things that we learned from the council report is, although again, you heard it wasn't necessarily a, a complete capture of all the things happening in Edmonton, we know where there are some hot spots that are currently um, serving our nighttime economy in terms of um, the largest impact. Mm -hmm. That's one way you could prioritize. And another is like we heard uh, our main streets. These are really important areas of our city that again already have uh, an active organization and a community involved sur surrounding them and supporting them. Um, but again, the way we would do that is, is look to that Nighttime Economy Alliance to help guide us in terms of where to go first. Understanding we've got limited resources, limited time, and we wanna move towards action quickly. Thank sure. you. Good. Thank you, Constable Hamilton. Constable Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just looking for, for some more reflections on the value of having that dedicated point person or, or lead um, from a real sort of tangible operational sense. What would that look like? What would that feel like? And how would it be different than um, the experience that, that businesses have today? So in our current structure, um, when we, we went and, and took a look at what was going on inside city administration, there is a lot of work going on, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily communicated, coordinated, well understood um, to ensure that we are being as effective as we could be in this, this space. So that individual is intended to be the one point of contact to bring that focus towards the nighttime economy, to make sure that in our existing work, nighttime economy is being considered, to ensure that communication is happening inside the organization, externally, within community, with those that want to um, uh, visit and experience our nighttime economy, and then would be helping to shepherd the Nighttime Economy Alliance, that group that's going to be providing us with continuous advice and feedback and guiding where our actions go. So it's taking a system that has a lot of really great stuff in it and then pulling it together to make sure that it is having focus and moving forward in a way that's going to have impact. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I also just wanted to ask about, uh, I guess one, one thing that is sticking out for me is connections and exchanges. Like we, we have a plan for arts and culture and it just seems so, so intimately tied to the conversation we're having today. Um, I guess thoughts on that. It, it, it seemed like it was a bit of a, a missing piece uh, as part of the conversation. And maybe that is part of sort of day-to-day -day operations and that is considered, but um, as such a sort of fundamental and core document that guides <clears throat> us in that space, how is that integrated? That's a, that's a really good question, Councillor Salvador, because um, you're right, it doesn't 
feature prominently in, in the consultant's report in the strategy. We did comp contemplate um, including arts and culture in the NEA in terms of representation. So should it not have been as prominent in the strategy, we have a mechanism um, should we move forward with the advisory group to make sure that it is connected into the bigger picture, into that systems approach. Yeah, and I would. Sorry, oh. I'll just add, um, the Edmonton, Art, our Edmonton Arts Council was part of the steering committee as well, so we, we did uh, attempt to include that perspective through their lens, so. Okay, okay, that's that's good to know, um, and I think, yeah, moving moving forward, uh, I think that's, again, just a really important angle and, and uh, document and strategy to root ourselves in. Um, I was also just curious, you know, lots of talk about safety, social disorder um, that, that uh, was featured in the consultant report. Um, do we know, it sounds like EPS was probably one of the, the stakeholders that was involved as well. I'm just looking for some, some clarity there. Yes, EPS was well. Okay, okay, fantastic. Um, and yeah, just piecing together who was at that table. It sounds like, of course, BIAs were part of those those engagement sessions. Um, was ETS, there was a lot of talk about uh, transit safety and mobility and making sure that people can uh, get to our main streets. Uh, were they part of it too? Yeah, the consultant was able to connect with someone from ETS to uh, get their perspective. So we did try to in involve them as well as much as we could. Okay. Uh, one other thing I'll add during the uh, nighttime audit, the uh, consultant did actually take transit as well, so that helped to kind of inform their report. Okay, and then uh, I'm just gonna throw this question out there as well. Um, the date of the audit. That was in February of 2023. How, how did, how was seasonality accounted for in some of the analysis? A uh, good question. We, we, we were kind of a little bit tied due to timing because there was some funding that was secured to help fund the, uh, the strategy development and it had deadlines that had to be adhered to. Um, so we were limited in the, the, the times that we could do the, uh, the audit. Um, also, we are a winter city, so we did want to really kind of highlight the options in the nighttime during the winter. So we wanted the consultant to experience that aspect as well. And it was felt that the winter aspect would be harder for them to get a grasp of than the summer would. So, so it, I mean, it was cold. It, it, it was a, I was out with them. It was a great experience. I think they, they got a good uh, look at our nighttime and, and what we offer in the, in the winter. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was overall, it was, a, it was actually an interesting time to go. Great, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, I think a lot of a lot of positive points um, to touch on. Uh, I'll also sort of have a round on nighttime economy and then the other two reports. So, you know, just wanted to 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 delve into maybe some of the the challenges that that were highlighted. Um, so, in terms of timing, the report referenced that the the action plan was received uh, in June of 2023. And so just just wondering why that's now coming forward to us at, at this point. The, the two previous times that the report was scheduled, it was rescheduled for budget. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've got moved, which got us to here. So it has been rescheduled due to different agenda management items. Okay, that's helpful. And I think that's something for us to reflect on when we're doing agenda review and, and, and whether that's it happening with administration or with council. I think keeping a sight line on some of our priorities is, a, is an important process, but thank you for that context very much. Um, you know, we also heard some concerns with the action plan itself and, and you know, truthfully, some gaps stood out to me as well. Um, you know, the actions weren't sort of nested under the pillars. Um, some of the metrics just seemed sort of beyond the control of a, of a nighttime coordinator or, or alliance. Um, just wondering if part of the work of the uh, position, of the person filling the position, if we do move in that direction, will be to potentially refine and revise uh, the action plan in consultation with stakeholders. That's the exact spirit. Um, we want to have this position as well as the uh, Nighttime, Econ Nighttime Economy Alliance inform. The um, strategy really is a reflection of the consultants' observations mm -hmm. that they um, experienced through the audit, through the um, survey, through the engagement they did, um, but it really is a reflection of their expertise in, in terms of their advice 
yeah. towards how, how we should move forward as a city. And, and you know, I think having an outside perspective is helpful. I think what I what I heard today and what I also felt reading through the document is that it's not necessarily a, a step by step plan that we can follow, if you know what I mean. So so I'm glad to hear that that's going to be part of the mandate of that that position. You know, I really appreciated the focus on uh, you know what a success the downtown uh, the director of downtown vibrancy has been. I would I would echo that. I think it's been a great success, and part of the success I think has been that. You know, we started with that one position, but then additional, a team was built up around that as well. And so my mind goes to our business friendly team. And is there opportunity there to, to repurpose or refocus some of those resources on businesses working in the nighttime economy? I think some of our resources in Business Friendly Edmonton already do support the nighttime economy. Um, however, there's not one position that is solely focused. Um, so our Business Friendly Edmonton team provides one-on-one -on -one support. They mm -hmm. provide workshops. They work on Capital City pilots. Um, so, And there's seven staff. And that's, and I think that speaks to what, what I think we really heard today is that having a, an intentional position. So again, I don't think, and that's why I think we could repurpose a position. It wouldn't necessarily change the workload or add to the workload. It would just provide focus to that, that workload of an individual on that team of seven, potentially. Potentially, I think it would be um, for the things that we're talking about in um, the, um, the NEA in terms of their support and what they would require to support those 42% of the actions that aren't um, underway, that would require at least an FTE. So the, it would just mean impacts to other areas of our business. And what I want to clarify, sorry, we would still, like in my mind, we would still have a director of the nighttime economy and then there would be one person on the business support team that is dedicated to, to nighttime businesses. So Councillor Stevenson, if I'm understanding you correctly, this would be, we would have uh, some expertise built within our existing group totally. that should a question come in specific to nighttime economy, they've got one point of contact. Exactly. Okay, Perfect. I understand, Perfect. thank you. Then another piece of feedback I've heard is the, the very big need for modified work hours for the director of the nighttime economy. So working noon to eight, for example, as their standard work hours. Will that be contemplated as uh, if, if this goes forward? We are looking at, uh, should this go forward, we'd have to look at a job description and what it would take to make this person successful. And so um, those types of flexible hours would be something we would take a look at. And I would go beyond <coughs> flexible, like I think a requirement uh, yep. is what I've heard from businesses. Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, and thank you for, for your work. Uh, we've heard like some criticism over the report, but I understand how difficult it is to put something like this together when you're not entirely sure what the intended outcome is for it. So I really appreciate the work. Um, I guess my, uh, my first question is um, uh, to, to follow up with what Councillor uh, Stevenson was asking is that um, when it comes to stakeholders and consultation, um, I'm assuming that that that's something that like, do you already have that in mind or is that something that you are looking to develop uh, as a sort of continuous feedback mechanism? We would include that as a continuous feedback me mechanism with the Nighttime Economy Alliance. Okay, yeah, because I mean we've got uh, Explore here, we've got representatives from all of these other uh, economic interests and activities and uh, Obviously, there's a connection point for all of those, and so I'm just curious what that ends up looking like in, in practice. So it's a tough question, I, I get it, because it's very nebulous right now, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, part of what we're looking at with the NEA is having, doing some marketing, having a website, so would it be in person, electronic? not sure what the, the rhythm would look like. All we know at this point in time is that it's something we need to do. You heard of, of this approach as something that's iterative. So we know that uh, engagement is part of the approach that we need to undertake with the NEA. Yeah. And we'll need to, to build out what that specifically so. looks like. But it's included as a, not a let's consider it, it's included as a, this is one of the expectations. Yeah, and I was probably unclear. You, uh, Sounds like you're talking about the mechanisms of engagement. I was talking about like uh, the spirit of engagement. Yes, short answer. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. And, but it will be an, uh, a continuous sort of conversation uh, because that's one thing that we've run into problems with before is we've kind of set it and forget it. And then like six months later, everyone's like, we don't even know what's going on. And that's not going to be the case here. That's not the spirit here. Okay. Well, I believe that. Uh, so um, I guess the next question is um, when it comes to uh, what the focus is going to be for success, like that mandate. Uh, I mean, so far the mandate is started up and it, it, when some motion is made, which I think is coming, start it up, get going. But what does that look like, get going? And how fast can we do it? Because that's really the crux of it. It's, uh, we talk about iterative, but really what we need is an explosive motion to jumpstart this, you know, the, it, we're talking about economy and it takes a lot of like buildup, but I think we've got, you're, you guys are smart. I've seen you guys do amazing things. So how fast can we do this? That is a good question. Um, as soon as we can get the um, position in place, that's when we move quick. So if we can do this within three months, I would be impressed. Okay. All right. So that is my expectation then? Is that what you're telling me? To, it's a three-month sort of thing? That's my starting point. When we get into it, Councillor Paquette, it might look different. But I hear you in terms of you want us to move at speed. That's the desire. And so if given a mandate to do this, we are asked to move at speed to put something in place quickly. Okay. So while we're waiting on that, which I understand why, um, there are a lot of other things that sort of are, are snag points. Uh, you know, in, in getting things moving in the city. You know, some people call it red tape, but I don't like that because some red tape is super necessary. But there are snag points that we can probably clear up really quickly. And is there sort of a motivation to do that as we prepare for the bigger effort? There is. When uh, my, my advice would be um, for businesses that are experiencing those snag points to contact us through Business Friendly Edmonton through our one-on-one -on -one support. And so we'll look for those snag points and and work to resolve them as quick as we can because yeah. we've got a mechanism in place to do that. And everything I'm asking mm -hmm. is not a, is in no way a criticism because I understand that you are constrained by budgets as well. And if you had a larger budget, things would happen much more rapidly. And I understand that. So maybe that's another conversation that we need to have going forward. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, you know. Uh, I get very positive feedback on uh, business-friendly Edmonton office, so please pass on uh, my appreciation to them. On the uh, on the events, mm -hmm. uh, this is to explore. Uh, I think we invest close to two point two million dollars in the in the events, Roger, right? And uh, that generated uh, economic activity or impact of seventy-two million dollars. That's a huge investment. I mean, that's a huge return on, on on the investment. But that does pay back, right, uh, in the form of property taxes, businesses growing, and then business paying property taxes, business, you know, starting up, maybe, uh, maybe to explore. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, one of the, I appreciate being here, and thank you for allowing us to be here, because yeah. from Explore Edmonton's perspective, we need both those big events uh -huh. and to support the local economy that we have. And in fact, those work together. It so I don't think it's one, yeah. yeah. And I think that as we're investing in one, it supports the other, but we need to reflect on both of those. So as an example, um, we certainly appreciate with Explore Edmonton that we can contact administration when we have a big event coming like Juno's, mm -hmm. uh, like we did. Um, cleanliness, uh, repaired windows. I think we really put on our best face for Juno's. And what we also hear from our music venues here and from the restaurant community and hospitality, for example, is how can we extend that so that it's it's also ongoing. Got it. So what are our plans? What are our plans to continue to attract these events? Cultural events, sports events, right? And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and just to, to speak to that, I mean, we see those events as anchor events. So they do two things. They're, they spread out activity throughout the year that yeah. would naturally happen. 
but they're anchors that we want to use as catalysts for other things. So again, mm -hmm. if we use Junos, I know uh, there was a, a, a presenter around that. There were 50 other events that we tried to support and we did work with uh, different uh, areas around town so that they weren't all focused in, in the downtown. So again, I see a tie to all these things, including the nighttime economy that can be more formalized mm -hmm. so that we're using those big events to also support nighttime economy. Yeah, they're, they're connected, they're interconnected, right? And, and one, one feeds the other, one helps the other, and, uh, and they're all tied to economic growth and vibrancy, right? So on the, uh, uh, the report around uh, uh, marketing, I think it's a good conclusion that, you know, Edmonton events, uh, Edmonton Fort Edmonton Park, uh, Dallas World of Science and other city funded entities, they focus on their activities, right? But Explore Edmonton's role is to promote our city and promote their events. So that, I think you're, you're probably satisfied and happy with that conclusion. And, uh, and can you build, can you, you want to comment on that? No, I really, I really appreciated that report, and I yeah. think um, it provided clarity. So, yeah. in addition, those particular um, operators do some marketing, but more within Edmonton or very specific geographic target markets where they know people will be going to the TELUS World of Science, mm -hmm. for example. But I also did want to reinforce that the assets that we build for more of the longer haul or international attraction are shared amongst any any operator, not just our city of Edmonton facilities, but any operator. So they would all have access, for example, to the photography and the video okay. that, that we use. Got it, got it. And my last question, I think, uh, you know, we gave Explore $6 million on a one-time funding, then we have to find another $6 million on a sustainable long-term way to, give, to build their base. I think within that is also a uh, strategy to promote Edmonton to Edmontonians, right? Was that, is that, would you be able to do that within those resources or is that additional? I don't think that we will do that properly with the six million. The okay. six million is still, um, it still does our base programming. Okay. It would not provide for additional. I agree that I think there's a significant gap in communicating what we have in Edmonton to Edmontonians and that has a knock on effect of, of us being advocates to our visitors and I would share that our visitors sentiment of Edmonton as a place to visit is much higher than how Edmonton yeah. would express that and so um, I would look forward to an opportunity to be more focused Got on it. that. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you so much for everyone's work. Uh, with that I'm going to go, go to Councilor Cardmel. Thank you. Uh, I just want to build on that just a little bit more uh, and just with respect to the current funding levels. So uh, Mayor Sohi made reference to we've invested two and a half million dollars and we have quite a return, but our budget right now today is what? Maybe to uh, Ms. Brenner. Thanks for the question, Cart Councillor Cartmel. Um, our base budget for event attraction is just over about 550000 The 2.2 that you referenced, Mayor Sohi, included some value and kind services, so that's um, you know, and a large part of that would be related to the Big Air event because uh, they required significant support from the stadium and, and that. So, um, and so that's really kind of where we sit at from a cash perspective. So in 2023, that's what we committed to. So, and that was just city funding. That was not Explorers funding because Explorers funding comes from EDMH. Yeah, yeah. And so in order to meet uh, well, there's two things, I guess. There's a plan for 24, 25, 26. And right now that requires an additional investment from, from the city to match that EDMH funding that Explorer already has, correct? That's correct. And that's the, that is what's contained in the uh, unfunded service package that's coming to SOBA, yeah? That's correct. And I think it's $2 million a year for the next three years, or is it more? Yes, that's, that's what the motion that was made um, asks for and uh, so we have uh, looked at the funding and um, that would be adequate to allow us to fund um, the events that we have planned and a, a couple of events that are in discussion uh, as well too. So. so here's the trick question. 
well, I shouldn't say it that way. I'm not trying to trick you. Here's the 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 more uh, refining question: How many how many of those dollars do we need to meet obligations that we already have? How, now, how, what do we need to serve the contracts that we've already signed? Do we have that number? And if not, maybe we should have that number when we get to SOBA. Yeah, I have that number. Um, it's just I didn't do the the total of it all. So um, we probably. Uh, in 25 and 26, we're pretty close to the 2.55 that it would give us. And in 2024, just because of, um, you know, by the time the SOBA comes around, we're going to be well into uh, the end of the fourth month of the year. So we've, we've probably held back on a little bit of commitment for 24, just because we weren't sure on funding at this point. Right. So, yeah, and Councilor Carmel, I'd only add that, is, is you know these events are planned are ways in the future and having yeah. a budget secured now then we can bid on things for 27 28 with the confidence that we can meet those obligations and just as a reminder if if uh council chose to uh put the funding in two million dollars a year 24 25 26 if we do all the events that are uh, that are contained in that motion uh what is the estimated economic return to the city and uh knowing that it doesn't come to our balance sheet but but What's what's the economic uh, impact? If, if you can give me a minute, I'll just quickly do it. Um, I could do it. I have it all for the events for twenty four. Oh, sorry, um, Councillor Cartmo, I can I can assist with that. Um, coming coming live from the Northwest Territories right now, so I'm hoping my internet is is okay. Um, if we look at our 2023 results, there was a direct economic impact of 88 million. 2024 is increasing and looking very strong on the sports and culture side with a, an estimated direct impact of 99 million coming into the city. And that impact, uh, we talk a lot about the nighttime economy and I, you know, respecting the comments that were made earlier that these are one-time injections into the economy, but they they fill up the, the hotels, the restaurants, the bars, they keep people employed. Uh, well, at least they contribute to the employment of those people uh, in a pretty significant way. Is that fair to say? It is. And I think as we, we look at these types of events, these, these major sporting and cultural events, we plot them out through the calendar to ensure that they are coming year round. And so there is that um, real attention to detail of when these type of events are coming. And we will make shifts. So there is opportunity to say, OK, 2024, this doesn't make sense. We have a number of major events happening. So maybe we look at 25 or 26. One of the things, though, with these major events is the fact that it, it creates peaks and valleys. Um, and so there are these peaks of business when we have thousands of, of people, tens of thousands of people um, attending a, a major sporting event or a concert. Um, and then there's the drop off. And that's part of the challenge as well. And we talk about the critical mass of events um, and just building out that calendar through the year. Thank you. I, I've, thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Cartman. I think it'll be very good uh, for SOBA. I think what information Councillor Cartmel is was looking for, well, if that is available in more detail, will be very helpful for our decision making on the on the budget, like whatever obligations are on current events that we we have bid for, what are we bidding for, and future, right? So then we get a we can have a good discussion on that. So with that, I'm going to go to Councillor Hamilton. Can I just, yeah. Mayor Sui, on yeah. some of that, um, we can bring it forward. Some of it may have to be discussed in confidence. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Of we course. don't want to yeah. give anybody our secrets on what we events got, we're going after. Got it, absolutely. Good. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Um, I know we're running up on time here, so maybe I'll be brief, because I, I think the... Um, uh, I think this is a good lens. I didn't want to lose the cultural and sport piece. Um, maybe something to explore Edmonton as we're considering, I'm gonna say today is about the tension, I think between the really big investments that sort of denote an era um, uh, in our city versus this sort of the ongoing heavy hard work of, of building a community locally to support those events when they come. And I think um, uh, the reference to Commonwealth Games um, I think was really apt today because it's not just about placemaking but time making. So I'm wondering if you can speak to 
um, the impact that some of these major events have in building up that day-to-day -day capacity and, and uh, community. It, it certainly, Councillor. I think the, the notion of building the volunteer base and that capacity, the, the uh, facility legacies that have been left behind for some of those events. So I think the accumulation and the, and the, the week in, week out, the smaller events, the annual events, they just contribute to that overall legacy of our ability to host events, to do a good job of hosting events. Uh, as Tracy mentioned earlier, with things like the Junos, where we did try and do a number of events around the city to make it a six-day celebration, not a one-night celebration, and to introduce people to those those local uh, places where they can see live music, and hopefully they come back after the event. So it is really trying to build on the, all of the strengths of our community and use events to, to really make us proud of where we live and create those opportunities to participate in those. We're seeing lots of events now, including a mass participation piece as well. So there'll be an elite competition, but then opportunities for Edmontonians to participate in the sporting events. Uh, so it really is trying to build the legacy that's long, long term and sustainable, not just a one time in and out for an event. Thank you. Did you have anything to add, Ms. Bedard? I just wanted to to maybe make the point that um, that there are also very practical considerations. So when we bring in one of those major events, um, a local tourist would spend about four hundred dollars, and uh, a, a, an international spends two thousand dollars. So one of the reasons that we need to balance both types of events, um, aside from the additional comments uh, that my colleagues have made, is because it does bring new money into Edmonton, which is then spent in the restaurants um, and the music um, venues uh, and those things. The other, the other point I would make about events and sort of the practical reality of those um, is sort of the long-term view and commitment that we need to commit to that. And then there's an efficiency to those recurring, recurring events. And I would just note that EDMH did make a four-year commitment to explore Edmonton for those events so that um, they could continue to see an increased return on that. Great, and I see Mr. Clark is sitting next to you, and I know that you have a unique lens in terms of the um, impact of, uh, amateur, I'm gonna say professional sport on amateur sport participation and community. So I was kind of digging around to see if you would have a lens on that. Uh, thank you, uh, yeah, Reed Clark here, first time uh, caller, long time listener. Um, but yeah, on that side, with my organization, with Sport Edmonton taking the lead on that, I mean, um, where we talk about this community legacy piece, to have these big events that Tracy and her team and then Ronan and team and the city brings in, that gives credibility to do these community legacy pieces. Like, we could organize our own pickup basketball event, and I think that's great, but nobody might really show and there might not be the immediate attention and might not get the kids and the other people across the city really excited and involved in it, right? The fact that where we're around and taking on space is to kind of make sure there's something left behind for the community. And, and tying in, obviously, the professional sports teams just gives more credibility to that and brings more light and tension on that. that that's great. Thank you. Those are my questions. Because I just had to, we do see an, an increase in sport participation after major events. So when kids get to see, you know, up close and personal role models, they see it in Olympics games, that we see the participation in those sports drive up. So having those events here, having kids see, uh, you know, top level athletes, role models in the city is, is really important in building the sport as well. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you know, just want to acknowledge the really positive feedback we heard from from stakeholders in terms of the event attraction uh, ecosystem. So, so I think that's kudos to your great work. And, you know, I'm I'm really interested in better understanding how we can how we can strengthen that further. Uh, so, destination marketing. Um, you know, I think the motion referred to sort of other other agencies funded by the city. And so, I was anticipating. Um, consideration of Edmonton Global and Edmonton Unlimited as well, given that they do, you know, international marketing and I think I think place branding as well. So just wondering, I, I don't believe I saw them in the report, just wondering what discussions there may have been with those organizations. Yeah, Tom, go ahead and take that. Hi, Councillor. Thanks for the question. Um, you're correct. Those organizations were not included in that work. We did focus on Explore Edmonton 
and the the venues that are, are attractions that are mentioned in the report the focus was on the visitor economy not so much uh foreign direct investment or business attraction yeah fair enough and i think you're right that that those functions are are separate but some of the materials that get developed seem seem interchangeable um, in terms of highlighting edmonton is a great place to live so i don't know if uh paul is part of the delegation yeah okay yeah please please go ahead yeah, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. To Tracy's earlier point, um, the assets that are being prepared and, and developed through our shop within our marketing team, they are also shared out through um, Edmonton Global and Edmonton Unlimited, um, Edmonton Film and Screen, as well as other sectors as well. So we, we have a digital asset management library um, that can be accessed across um, city entities, but we also share those assets in sectors like the real estate sector. Sure, um, Sorry, I'm just really mindful of my time. My my colleagues on committee are being very patient with me as this is not my committee. Um, okay, so I'm hearing that there is opportunity for sharing, but there's maybe not sort of that proactive coordination of what materials are being responded to. Ms. Uh, Speaker Bednard, if you... Yeah, thanks. So I think um, we work really well with those organizations in an informal way. I'll give you an example. There's a Canadian Hydrogen Conference. We work with Edmonton Global to prioritize, bring that, produce that. And then in turn, I will be a speaker so that I can talk about uh, Edmonton and quality of life. I think it is also true, and we've identified that there is a gap in the integrated promotion of Edmonton mm -hmm. as a whole, mm -hmm. externally, and to our own community. Yeah, and I think that, that for me, is where there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so, you know, I, I think if that is work that will continue, I think we could see, again, just recognizing that we, we fund all three of those organizations, and if we're funding all three of those organizations to develop reasonably similar videos and, and content. I think there could be some savings there. So appreciate that those conversations are happening and will continue. I'm just gonna rush through very quickly. Did I understand correctly from the report that Explore Edmonton's base funding, recognizing that's a bit of a moving target at this point, but it doesn't include any destination marketing. That's all through the partnership with Edmonton Destination Marketing Hotels contribution? They, they invest in the event attraction piece um, and some of our marketing as well as, as do you. So that would, be, that would be joint. We also work with our other um, orders of government to, to have their investments. So for example, Travel Alberta invests $1 million a year. Okay, oh, okay, okay, thank you for that. Um, you know, I was really excited to read about the scorecard that was referenced in relation to the new framework that was developed. Um, you know, I think that's so critical for us in helping us to decide what events make sense for us to invest in. I don't know that we have the framework or do we have, like I think my biggest question is will, will you use that scorecard when you're coming to council for a decision on an event? Uh, Councillor Stevenson, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, the scorecard is part of the framework. Council doesn't have the framework yet because we, um, our, we've been working with a consultant. He's away right now, so um, we will bring it to you when it's completed. We'll send it to council through a memo, Perfect. and the scorecard would basically define um, when we evaluate events what, that we're going to go after. And so, if we're bringing a mega that requires council support, we would certainly uh, look at that scorecard as a, that first step of. Uh, indication whether we want to pursue the event. Great. I think so. that'll be a very helpful tool. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. So we are at 4.54. Uh, we have concluded questions on these three items. So thank you so much to uh, administration and the delegation from Explore Edmonton. Uh, with that, we uh, uh, can someone move, can we move all three recommendations at the same time? Yes. They're all for information? Yes. Okay. Uh, Councilor Hamilton? Uh, I will move that the following reports be received for information. Um, that's items 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3. Got it. Okay, we have motion on the floor. Now, if anyone wants to speak, I'm going to limit time to one minute each. Is that okay? Right? Okay, so we can get through the agenda on time. Uh, okay, who would like to sleep, uh, speak? Council Salvador? Yeah, so just in the interest of time, I uh, appreciate all the reports uh, and all the work that went into them. I'm going to focus my speaking on the nighttime economy strategy, 7.1, um, and, and just start by saying uh, I actually really appreciate the mayor's leadership on this file in particular. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about this and have heard from, um, from many speakers over the last few years. I, th I think we should be 
moving on uh, forward uh, with this with some urgency. Uh, so very pleased to be able to have that conversation at SOBA so that we can advance this work. Um, the economic return is so crystal clear. Uh, we know that our nighttime economy is key for talent attraction and retention. Uh, it's a vehicle for safety and vibrancy. And we know that it helps drive and sustain our, our local economy and our main streets as well. Uh, we have what I think is an incredibly unique opportunity here in Edmonton, given our strong roots in arts and culture, to be able to leverage the creative economy in a way that uh, differentiates ourselves and, and improves quality of life for Edmontonians. Um, and my time is basically out. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So there you go. Thank um, you. Wonderful work. Thank you. Councilor Paquette. One minute. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, so quickly, um, we, uh, if you look at the budget, uh, what we are is a uh, on the operating side of police city and on the capital side of road city and uh, Anything else under that is like something that uh, we uh, definitely have to debate I'd also like us to be a city that takes economic activity and economic strength very very seriously and I think that we do in this uh, You know this kind of effort is one of the building blocks for that. I know that um, you know a lot of people will say, well, you're investing this money, where's it going, you know, yada, yada, yada. And those are great questions. But I, I think about the um, uh, accelerator grant that was uh, for the downtown, it's $26 million for residential builds. Not only are we getting uh, made whole from that over time, but it is unleashing, it has unleashed hundreds of millions of dollars of capital investment in the city. That's why we do these things, and that's why it's important. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bucket. Quickly, I know SOBA discussion is going to be a difficult discussion, but we cannot stop making strategic investments that help grow our economy. Right? I think it's very, very important for us to do that. So I look forward to that discussion on April 23rd. I will be bringing forward an amendment to do that related to uh, funding the night nighttime economy and look forward to other amendments as well that will help us grow our economy, create jobs, bring more investment into our city, create vibrancy in, uh, in our downtown, on our main streets, uh, uh, and really build that exciting uh, uh, exciting uh, opportunities and also about the future. I think this is not just about present, but also how do we build the economy of the tomorrow and nighttime economy will allow us to do that and other investment will do that too. So with that, I look forward to that conversation on 23rd of April. Okay, with that, I am gonna to go to Councillor Hamilton to close. Nothing more to say, great discussion Thank today. You. Thank you. Okay, all right, so please vote. Councillor Jans, are you online with us? In favor, in favor. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And uh, we're done with the notes of motion. The motion with our government notes. We are adjourned at 4.59. One minute before.